The Foundation field agents are overwhelmed. They're forced to the ground, beaten and subdued, then dragged into the darkness, screaming. Their weapons and training mean nothing, and the strangest part of all, the people doing this to them are grinning Texans wearing cheesy Christmas sweaters. The prisoner feels the light bleeding between the curtains, stirring him from a restless sleep. Going to bed and retaining any hope that he'd get a reprieve from the days ahead had long since become impossible. He used to dream of places he'd go, things he'd do with his life, instead of repeating the exact same cycle day in and day out. Forcing himself up and out of bed, he tries to remind himself that it's just another day, one more day in purgatory. He doesn't ever see it stopping and doesn't bother imagining being free. It's about living through each day as it comes, one at a time, with one constant goal. Survival. He looks towards the foot of his bed and sees the uniform, the overalls he has to don every day. They'd once been a novelty, but now they are his camouflage, his way of keeping under the radar so he can make it through just one more day like any other. The street gleams with the eye-searing, garish colors coming through the curtains all night long. The bright, oversaturated twinkling is made all the worse against the clear white backdrop of artificial snow that coats the streets and sidewalks, crunching underfoot, as well as being sprayed all over every house as far as the eye can see. It directly juxtaposes the sweltering Texas heat. Seeing the ground strewn with fake snow and the buildings draped in lights doesn't mix with the unbearable heat the prisoner feels inside the fur of his uniform and the sweat from the false beard that covers half his face. The sound of people approaching almost causes his heart to burst from his chest, beating a mile a minute. He can't let them see him like this, he tells himself, and takes a deep breath. Sticking out the padding strapped over his stomach, he lowers the tone of his natural voice, a trick that has become second nature to him, out of necessity rather than dedicated practice, and then he begins to sing. Every word to It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year by Andy Williams is even more familiar than his own name, forever etched onto the surface of his brain so that he can recall them with perfect accuracy should the moment require. He's learned them all, every lyric of every song, Brenda Lee, Wizard, Dean Martin, Slade, even that one by Mariah Carey that now sounds like fingernails dragged down a chalkboard every time he recites it, memorized down to every beat, so that, as he walks down the street singing as loudly as possible, nobody pays him any attention at all. As this walking festive jukebox of a man walks down the street, he notices the passers-by. There are three of them, two adults and a child, things that look like people, but aren't. Maybe they once were, before they were hollowed out and had all their thoughts replaced with those smiles are always the most unnerving thing about them. They're too wide across their faces, like every muscle in their jaws has been stretched just a bit too far. Add to that their eyes, staring unblinkingly at the prisoner as he walks by, almost expectantly. He bellows in his jolliest sounding voice, wishing them all a Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Despite it being the middle of the day, he hears their passing footsteps collectively stop, and a panicked bead of icy sweat crawls down his spine. Have they noticed? Did he just make enough of a slip-up for them to pounce on it? Turning to face them, he offers a jovial wave and the stereotypical deep laugh, hoping that it'll be enough for them to spare him. All three stare, their vacant grins indistinguishable from cheer or psychotic rage. Then, they all return the wave and echo the same greeting back at him. The prisoner gives a laugh again to placate them, being careful not to show how relieved he is before he continues on his merry way. The barrier that surrounded the area seemed to have sprouted overnight. A thick concrete wall encircled the neighborhood, topped with what looked to be electrified steel cables. It hadn't been there before that one fateful night when all of this had started. Someone was trying to box them in, keep them contained. The prisoner had just been unlucky enough to be on the wrong side when they, whoever they were, sealed off the area, trapping him with the others. He's already worked his way around the circumference of the wall, day in, day out, searching for an opening whenever he can slip away from the rest of the neighborhood for long enough. He checks over his red fur-coated shoulders to see if anyone's noticed him. The previous group he passed was too busy hanging more blinking fairy lights on their house to spot him slipping past, right up to the edge of the neighborhood. There is a gate, he'd seen that after a month of searching, but not only did it stay shut tight, locked by whoever put it there, 
It's too close to the center of the neighborhood. If he made any attempt to leave that way, there was no doubt that he'd be spotted in an instant. And if they see him, he shudders at the thought of what he saw happen to his elves. Elves, he thinks to himself. Has he really started to go native after only a year? Or has it been two? Three? The prisoner forces a thought to the back of his mind, the worrying notion that this recurring nightmare might have only lasted a few weeks. What if the constant reliving of the same winter holiday has driven him mad already? From the sack slung over his shoulder, he produces the two presents he'd been wishing for, a rope to scale the wall and a pair of insulated wire cutters. Luckily, his next door neighbors in his apartment building had been taken and left their tools behind. Finding their apartment empty with not a creature stirring had been surreal. At least, it was not any less surreal than walking around loudly singing Christmas songs with every ounce of enthusiasm he could fake. He hurls the rope upwards, trying to hook it around something that can hold his weight. Then, just as he secures it, preparing to start his climb, Ho, ho, ho! He hears the laugh, but not from beneath his own beard. The prisoner cranes his head to look over his shoulder, eyes immediately drawn to another figure, a man wearing a red and white outfit exactly like his. The duplicate is handing out presents to a gaggle of children, all their faces locked into those two wide grins with the same vacant eyes. Then, as the duplicate hands a wrapped gift to one of them, he looks up. His eyes catch sight of the prisoner, frozen to the spot with his escape rope in hand. Even at a distance, the prisoner can make out the desperate, subdued shake of the duplicate's head. It's unclear whether he was trying to non-verbally urge the prisoner not to try and leave, or was horrified as to what might happen if the things that looked like children caught sight of someone else dressed the exact same way. And sure enough, one of the widely grinning children follows the duplicate's gaze to see the prisoner. Like a school of piranhas catching the scent of blood in the water, they all turn to look. Just like that, the illusion is broken. There just couldn't be two Santa Clauses, and they all know what had to be done now. The screams of his fellow mall Santa duplicate ring out as the horde of children tackle him to the ground and start dragging his body across the asphalt. They shred his costume, ripping apart the false stomach and wrenching off his beard to reveal the ordinary-looking man inside. As a group of adults emerge as if from nowhere and begin speedily walking towards where the prisoner is still trying to climb to freedom. He fumbles with the rope, unable to grip it properly with the mittens he has over both hands, and the adults are getting closer, not one of them breaking a sweat in their hand-knitted, garish, festive sweaters as they run right for him. He can barely muster the upper body strength to lift himself more than a few off the ground, let alone scale the concrete wall in enough time. They're already swarming around him, dozens of hands belonging to these wild, smiling things, all clawing at his Santa suit, trying to drag him back down to earth. He fights them off, tries desperately swiping at some while gripping the rope as best he can. But enough of their fingers hook into the red fur costume, feeling the pain of landing flat on his back and having the wind knocked out of his lungs. All the prisoner sees is the huddle wearing their bright sweaters and unsettling grins, their hands reaching down towards him. When he wakes up, he's tied down to a chair in a dark room, his eyes pried open to stop him from blinking. Then the images start, the songs, all the ones he knows the words to, in a bombardment of highly concentrated Christmas cheer. It's unbearable, excruciating, and it lasts for days. What emerged afterwards might have looked like the prisoner without his Santa costume to keep him camouflaged anymore. Instead, he has on a horrible Christmas sweater, a wide grin, and a single tear falling from his eye. When the SCP Foundation installed fences around one of the neighborhoods within a small Texas township, turning the area into an isolated, gated hamlet, there was never any indication that they might have just condemned a pair of innocent mall Santas to a terrible fate. Welcome to SCP-784, which at first seems to be nothing more than a safe slice of suburban living, made up of 24 houses and two apartment buildings. For outsiders looking in, to call it a neighborhood seems like a bit of a misnomer. It's more of a slaverhood. It's evident by the multicolored fairy lights that adorn these homes and hang overhead in the street between them that the local residents have something of an infatuation with a certain holiday. In fact, they're so dedicated to celebrating it that it's not just one day out of the year. It's every day of every year. 
And if that sounds like your idea of hell, then just wait until you meet the neighbors. Inhabiting the area designated as SCP-784 is a group of approximately 300 anomalous entities that very closely resemble adult human beings, that is, save for a few crucial differences. For one, while all of these residents appear to age at the same rate as normal people, not one has been observed actually dying. They seem to just keep going. They carry on living the same day, the same holiday, over and over again on a loop in perpetuity. While these residents, collectively called SCP-784-1, will continue getting older, there never seems to have been any instance of funeral bells ringing instead of jingle bells within their strange neighborhood. Stranger still about SCP-784 is that in addition to none of its residents dying, none of them are ever born either. But then, how do any of them exist? Despite there being evidence of child instances of SCP-784-1 clearly running around, there has not been a recorded birth in the area for as long as the Foundation has had it under observation. They simply are, existing in perpetuity with no discernible start or observable conclusion. There is one common trait among all instances of SCP-784-1, however, and that's their relentless and often highly aggressive sense of Christmas cheer. They will all wear their most egregious Christmas sweaters at all times, as well as join each other in singing Christmas carols, directing and performing in nativity plays, and drinking copious amounts of eggnog all year round. Not content with limiting their insistent celebration to just the 25th of December, while the sun is up, a typical day within SCP-784 sees the various residents exchanging gifts with each other or decorating their homes with the various affects of the winter festive season. The Foundation has often observed them having a particular affinity for fairy lights. After dark, however, their preparation for the next day of Christmas seems to step this decorating up a notch, becoming more akin to Christmas-themed vandalism. One Foundation convoy that had stopped overnight near SCP-784 learned this the hard way. As the nearby residents hurled eggs at the prefabricated buildings that were in transit to a Foundation site, they overhaul one of the Foundation's Humvees and transform the vehicle into a sleigh as well as replace a shipment of fragmentation grenades with glass ornaments. The gas tanks of several Foundation vehicles were ruined beyond repair when the residents filled them with several liters of eggnog and rendered, or reindeered, these vehicles unusable. In addition, steel antlers were found welded onto the safety helmets intended to be issued to Foundation personnel. The unstoppable Christmas cheer of SCP-784-1 instances will become an act of intentional aggression if they detect any person or animal that they deem to not be displaying adequate levels of Christmas spirit. Should they see an animal that they do not feel has successfully embodied the holiday spirit, then this creature will become the immediate focus of all SCP-784-1 instances within a 4-meter radius. They will proceed to place a variety of holiday-themed accessories on said animal, which have been known to include collars with bells on, novelty reindeer antlers, and miniature Santa hats, as well as, on one occasion, a full-body reindeer costume designed to be worn by an animal. All things considered, when compared to how mandatory Christmas spirit is enforced on humans, the animals at least get off easier. When it comes to spotting people who aren't quite displaying the high level of Christmas cheer expected by the local residents, this can often lead to assaults and violent altercations. Any and all nearby SCP-784-1 instances will descend on their unaware victim and proceed to incapacitate them by any available means. Normally working as a group, not dissimilar from the way you might expect a zombie horde to function, the cheerful residents will abduct their target, normally forcibly directing them towards the nearest house in the area. Once their victim emerges, they will be dressed similarly to the locals, wearing an often hand-knitted Christmas sweater. From this point on, anything that once resembled their old self seems to have been replaced by the singular collective goal of the residents to celebrate Christmas every single day. Attempts to retrieve Foundation personnel from this fate all result in the affected individual resisting, as well as the action angering other instances of SCP-784-1. As for what the residents consider to be acceptable forms of something as intangible as Christmas cheer, there have been varying examples that indicate their definition of the concept is somewhat broad. In one encounter between SCP-784-1 and a member of SCP Foundation personnel, one Agent Paulson is patrolling the area when he wishes one of the residents a happy holidays. This causes around eight of the anomalous entities to surround him, 
preventing Paulson from escaping and then dragging him into a nearby house. During another incident, Foundation agent Matthews accidentally sings a verse of Silent Night incorrectly and is incapacitated by several of the local residents who proceed to tie him up using a string of decorative fairy lights. Another agent, Agent Sanderson, attempts to intervene, only for the two men to both be overpowered by a large crowd of SCP-784-1 instances. The pair are then also dragged into one of the neighborhood homes, and the sound of Christmas carols is heard emanating from within for several days without stopping. After Agent Anderson accidentally collides with and destroys a lawn ornament, a garden gnome made to look like Santa Claus, three residents emerge and quickly restrain him. A fourth emerges, and Anderson is then force-fed eggnog through the use of a funnel until he passes out. Having been made to ingest an extreme amount of the festive drink, Agent Anderson is then taken into the house the eggnog was retrieved from. In yet another similar reported incident, Agent Davis makes the mistake of failing to show the proper level of enthusiasm when a child instance of SCP-784-1 offers him a gift, as is customary for the season. As far as Agent Davis likely knows, just accepting the gift is engaging in enough Christmas spirit to be spared. Unfortunately, he's quickly proven wrong when he is tackled at the legs, knocking him over, before a number of other children emerge from a nearby house to drag Davis inside before he has any chance to recover. Around once every month, the residents of SCP-784 will engage in what the Foundation has taken to calling a Noel event. During this time, a group of SCP-784-1 residents will exit the area that they are intended to stay contained within and will attempt to gain access to the nearby wider suburban area. Each one of these instances is carrying a 15-meter-long string of Christmas lights on their person and attempts to use these to decorate any house they discover nearby and make them functionally identical to the homes within SCP-784. While you might be forgiven for thinking that a little bit of Christmas decoration isn't inherently insidious, it does raise a lot of concern if we consider the possibility that the SCP-784-1 instances are attempting to create new territory and instances of Christmas-loving creatures, thus spreading the holiday's influence. Fortunately, the Foundation is able to predict when a Noel event is likely to take place, given that they normally cause the SCP-784-1 instances to increase their usual festivities, usually through excessive consumption of eggnog and the presence of additional decorations. When expecting a Noel event, Foundation personnel must enact Procedure 784-C. They are to dress in Santa outfits and take up positions at the gated exit out of the neighborhood. When approached by the residents, these personnel are told to begin singing Good King Wenceslas, while also passing around a non-alcoholic substitute for eggnog. When SCP-784-1 instances approach, Foundation agents are to distribute eggnog laced with a mild sedative among the residents while maintaining cheerful at all times. Once this sedative-laced eggnog has been disseminated among the locals, Foundation staff are encouraged to sing Christmas carols that promote peace and goodwill. One of the most effective tools that has been proven to work against these local Christmas fanatics is that of Silent Night, providing one can get the words right, unlike poor Agent Matthews. However, the choice of exactly what should be sung is made by SCP-784-1 and personnel are advised to play along and agree. If residents begin to sing along with their choice of carol, the sedative from their eggnog will cause them to fall unconscious, at which point they are removed and returned to their houses, all while trying to avoid any violent responses that might occur if one of these sleeping SCP-784-1 instances wakes up. Any of the residents that make their way out of the confines of SCP-784 are to be retrieved and returned quietly by Foundation personnel. In the event that Procedure 784-C is ineffective, the backup plan is to instigate a different kind of silent night, wherein the Foundation will release aerosolized sleeping gas. Active instances of SCP-784-1 are to be restrained and brought back within the wall surrounding SCP-784. For now, with no known cure for such infectious Christmas cheer, the Foundation has no choice but to keep SCP-784 under constant observation, making sure they don traditional Christmas clothing should they ever need to venture inside and ensuring they limit the spread of the cheer should any SCP-784-1 instances make it out. There's no telling how quickly that aggressive Christmas spirit would spread if it got out of containment, but you can guarantee it would be a Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a bad night. The hitman pulls back the hammer of his Beretta with his thumb. The suppressor screwed into the barrel will help muffle the terrible crime he's about to commit. They're in the middle of the forest, his victim on his knees in front of him, his hands bound behind his back. 
The victim is spewing out excuses and feeble pleas for mercy at a mile a minute, but the hitman remains firm, aiming his handgun at the back of the victim's head. The victim owes his boss a great deal of money, but the hitman can't remember all the details. All he knows is what he needs to do. Bang, bang, bang. Three clean shots turned into cracks by the suppressor. His victim slumps forward, dead. It's time for the hitman to go home. The job isn't as glamorous as it is in the movies. He lives alone in a relatively small apartment. Most nights, he doesn't sleep well. He has nightmares. He sees every face he sent a bullet through every time he closes his eyes. So to make himself feel better, he watches his comfort movies with a bowl of microwaved SpaghettiOs. He's been through his DVD collection a thousand times. None of it has the punch it used to. But he's still got a working VCR, so there's no harm in fishing through the old pile of VHS tapes he keeps in his closet. That's where he finds his well-worn childhood copy of Forrest Gump. It used to be his mom's favorite movie. Perhaps it'll help him sleep tonight. He slots the VHS into the VCR. All the memories are flooding back to him now. He watched this movie so many times as a kid, it's a miracle that he didn't entirely wear the tape out. He's ready to lose himself in the film as he watches Forrest in his white suit sitting on that iconic park bench. The hitman smiles, ready to speak along to the movie's most famous line, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. But when Forrest says the line, it's life was like a box of chocolates. Was, 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 was. How strange. He doesn't remember the line being like that. It's life is like a box of chocolates, not life was, right? You wouldn't think such a tiny misquote would bother a man who kills people for the mafia for a living. But it does. This mistake feels so oddly pivotal to his understanding of the film, and therefore, to his understanding of himself. It feels like having a bucket of cold water poured out onto his head. He watches the rest of the movie, but something is off. He feels almost like Forrest Gump himself knows he's been watching. And scarier still, he's watching back. What happened to this nostalgic childhood classic? Over the next week, as he executes more deadbeats and poor unfortunate souls on behalf of his shadowy bosses, he just can't stop thinking about that line. Life was like a box of chocolates. There's something wrong about it, something so terribly wrong. How can he shoot a man dead without losing his appetite? But thinking about Forrest Gump is making his hands shake. He watches the movie every night. Some nights, he watches it more than once, instead of sleeping or showering. Every time he watches it, it feels just a little more uncanny. This movie used to fill him with joy and hope. It made him see the beauty in the world. But now he sees the darkness hiding underneath the surface. Every time he watches, he feels a growing suspicion towards the Forrest Gump character. Every so often, Forrest looks directly at the camera, staring out at the hitman and smiling. The hitman is sleeping even less now. He gets this feeling that something terrible is going to happen. It's funny. Normally, he's the terrible thing that happens to people. A few nights later, he's in the forest again, with another pleading victim on his knees in front of him. They all blur together eventually, but tonight, something is different. There's a certain chill in the air. The gun feels a little heavier in his hand. He presses the suppressed Beretta against the back of his victim's head and prepares to pull the trigger when he hears a twig snap. The hitman looks up, worried, and sees someone else standing in the forest, peeking out from behind the tree. A witness, but not just any witness. A familiar face. Is that? No, it can't be. Is that Forrest Gump? Before he can orient himself, his victim gets up and runs for it. The hitman is snapped free of his stupor, and Forrest Gump is gone. In a blind panic, he runs after the victim fleeing through the forest. He draws a bead on the victim's back and fires, sending a bullet through him and dropping him to the ground. He catches up shortly after that and finishes him off. He finished the job, but he can't shake the terrified feeling of what happened. He could swear he saw Forrest Gump in the forest, watching him. And that can only mean one of two things. Either he's being stalked, or he's losing his mind entirely. His obsession with the film gets worse after that. He'll spend whole days just watching it again and again, back to back, trying to find the secrets that must be buried somewhere within. Sadly for him, all he finds each time is more dread. He comes to believe that the movie is truly evil, that it contains some kind of entity that is more than human, more cruel, more terrible, and more powerful. 
Could this have been what he saw in the woods? At night, he hears noises, footsteps in the hallway outside the apartment, and then outside his bedroom. Once upon a time, he would have worried that he's been monitored by the city's police or agents from the FBI. Now, he's worried that he's being watched by something different altogether. He starts sleeping with his gun under his pillow. It's the only way he can feel anything close to safe with that thing out there, looking for him, hunting him. But if it came for him, would bullets even be able to stop it? The hitman stops going to work. He doesn't feel safe outside his apartment anymore. His bosses are confused, perhaps even a little concerned, worried that maybe their best hired gun has gone federal. But no, he's gone insane. But that doesn't mean he isn't right. He rarely changes out of his pajamas. He's tired, jittery, filthy, with a scraggly beard growing out of his chin. All he does these days is rewatch the movie. He thinks that if he watches it enough, he'll find some way to stop this terrible feeling he's been going through. But maybe it's making it worse, deepening his obsession. In every scene, he can feel Forrest Gump watching him through the screen. He always gives an evil grin, the same one he sometimes sees through his bedroom window in the middle of the night. Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. That's when he hears the door to his apartment open behind him. He grips his gun and rises to his feet. He can feel that a terrifying presence has entered the apartment. He needs to fight this thing, or he's going to die. He runs out into the hall of his apartment, ready to take on the threat head on. He wants to put a stop to the monster that has been making his life hell for all of these weeks. But the second he sees the figure standing in the shadows, he freezes up. It's him. It's the one and only Forrest Gump, wearing a terrifying evil smirk like a hungry predator. The hitman raises his gun and fires at the impossible intruder, but the bullets seem to have no effect. Gump lunges forward quickly and smashes the gun out of the hitman's hand with an effortless slap. All the hitman can do is turn and run, fleeing down the hallway into his bedroom and locking himself in. Bang! 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 He can feel Gump smashing his fists against the door. The hitman covers his ears, huddles next to his bed, and cries. He's never been this terrified before, not even as a child. Then the door shatters into splinters, and Gump, full of fury, enters. In what could be his dying moments, the hitman's animal brain takes over. He turns and tries to run, but Gump is far too fast. He rushes up, grabs the hitman by his shoulder from behind, and forces him down onto his knees. The hitman can't move. Gump is holding him in place, iron-like. Gump clenches his spare fist, lifts it up, and brings it down onto the back of the hitman's head with monstrous force. He will be found dead later that day. Crime scene cameras flash, capturing the grisly scene in the hitman's former apartment. The hitman's body is rolled onto a gurney and covered with a white sheet, rolled out of his apartment before decay can set in and destroy potentially valuable evidence. The lead detective on the scene is baffled by this whole setup. He's been aware of the hitman and his gang ties for years, but this death doesn't look like your typical gangland hit. After all, he'd been brutally bludgeoned to death. If he'd been done in by his fellow gangsters, he probably would have just been shot. There was no physical evidence of a forced entry or exit from the hitman's killer. Some of the hitman's neighbors had heard a handgun being discharged, but there is no blood from anyone other than the hitman on the scene, just spent shell casings and a few bullet holes in the wall. Strange. Would an experienced hitman fire that many times and miss his target with every single shot? Whoever took him out must have been truly dangerous. The detective does what he can, searching through the hitman's possessions while the CSI team strips down the rooms, hoping to find the piece of telltale evidence that could implicate the hitman's mysterious killer. The detective can't help but notice how filthy the apartment is. It looks like it hasn't been cleaned in weeks, a sharp contrast to the hitman's history of sharp, clean murders. It's the apartment of a man who knew someone was coming for him. But who? The detective just can't seem to piece it together. But during the search, the detective happens upon something that catches his eye, an old VHS copy of Forrest Gump. How strange, who has a working VCR these days? The detective looks closer and sees that the VHS and its case are covered in smeared, dirty fingerprints. He's been watching this, or at least handling it, a lot. Maybe it's some vector for secret messages between him and his employers. Perhaps it has some unknown meaning. Maybe some illicit crime has been recorded over the movie. 
He bags the VHS as evidence and takes it back to the precinct, where his men rustle up a VCR and organize an impromptu screening. The detective is eager for a break in the case, but as the tape plays, it just seems to be Forrest Gump. The detective is extremely confused. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the tape. Did the hitman just completely lose his mind by the time he was murdered? The detective's attention is jogged by one line, spoken by Forrest as he sits on the bench. Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Wait, that's not the line. Wasn't the line, life is like a box of chocolates? Later that night, the detective is lying in bed, unable to sleep. Somehow, it isn't the mystery of the hitman's murder that's keeping him awake. It's that one strange, misremembered line from Forrest Gump. He just can't get it out of his head. The only thing that draws his attention away is the sound of footsteps outside in the middle of the night. The detective snaps to attention, grabs his service weapon from his bedside cabinet, and creeps downstairs. He steps out of his house and into his backyard, now completely alert. The yard is mostly bathed in darkness, save for the little island of light formed by his porch light. Still, he sees something moving in the dark and levels his gun. He calls out, saying he's with the police, that it would be an extremely bad idea to try anything. There's no response. In a panic, the detective flees back into his home. Maybe this has something to do with the hitman's murder. Perhaps the perpetrators are trying to intimidate him into dropping the investigation. He'd call back up, he'd get some kind of assistance. But what the detective doesn't know is that it's already too late. He hears a noise outside again and looks up to see a face pressed up against his window. It's Forrest Gump, grinning maniacally. He reels back his head and slams it into the glass, sending cracks crawling out into every direction. He slams again and again and again. Before the detective can even react, the window is shattered, and Forrest Gump is climbing into his home with a single-minded, murderous purpose. It all makes sense to the detective now, in a deranged sort of way. The hitman hadn't been attacked by a vengeful enemy or taken out as a liability by his employers. He'd been murdered by Forrest Gump. And now, the detective is going to suffer the same fate. This peculiar little tale probably feels rather far-fetched to you, even by the standards of the entities and phenomena researched by the SCP Foundation. But we assure you that if you ever find yourself afflicted with SCP-5346, what was once a bizarre little case study could become a horrifying reality. Not a great deal is known about the mechanics of how exactly SCP-5346 operates, due to the rarity and obscurity of cases, but what we do know is that it affects people who view a certain scene in the beloved 1994 movie Forrest Gump, starring Tom Hanks as the titular lead character. The anomaly has a particular effect on those with an obsessive nature or people whose occupations involve needing to focus intensely on films, such as professional film critics. The scene in the film that appears to be the vector for infection is the one where Forrest is sitting on a park bench with a box of chocolates and opines that his mama always told him, life was like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. The first sign of infection is that the person viewing the scene will immediately feel confused, believing the quote to be, life is like a box of chocolates, not life was like a box of chocolates, as the character actually says. This is often thought to be a case of the Mandela effect, a common and harmless phenomenon where people report having false memories of prior events, such as misremembering a quote or believing a certain actor or public figure is dead when they're actually alive or vice versa. However, if this incident is an actual moment of SCP-5346 infection, then the victim is in for a far more unpleasant experience. They will first report an obsessive desire to re-watch the film, watching it again and again, and each time, noticing more inconsistencies between the film's reality and their memories of watching it. This will initially just seem strange, but as the condition progresses, it will take a turn for the unsettling. They will feel as though the Gump character is a malevolent force who is somehow watching them through the screen, displaying his own independent intelligence and a strong desire to harm the viewer. If the Foundation hasn't intercepted the case at this stage, it will get even worse. The victim will begin to see an individual with a remarkable resemblance to Forrest Gump stalking them in the real world, getting closer and more threatening by the day. The victim will eventually be found dead of extreme blunt force trauma to the cranium. How exactly they receive this blunt force trauma is unknown. The Foundation's discovery of this particular anomalous phenomenon began with a small thread of posts on the infamous Parawatch forums. 
a website dedicated to conspiracy theorists and paranormal enthusiasts of all stripes. The Foundation keeps a close eye on the Parawatch forums, as a number of anomalous cases have first been discovered through whisperings on its most strange and clandestine boards. The first post, from a user called Rage the Comic, real name Jackson Collins, detailed a peculiar experience. While quarantined in his home due to the 2020 viral pandemic, Jackson decided to re-watch Forrest Gump as a nostalgic favorite. That's when he noticed the cursed line discrepancy and decided to ask if others had the same sense of strangeness and confusion upon re-watching the film as an adult. The post quickly attracted the attention of some of the site's other users with mixed sympathy and derision. Jackson had clearly awoken something. Other forumites reported a similar sense of unease when revisiting the movie, sensing some kind of malice coming from the Forrest Gump character. But nobody was feeling this more than Jackson himself, the possible patient zero of the phenomenon. His severe paranoia increased, curdling into a dangerous obsession with the film, completely consistent with other people infected by the SCP-5346 phenomenon. This is the point where the Gump entity seemingly crossed the threshold, entering the physical world and stalking Jackson, appearing in his dreams and allegedly even staring through his windows, each time bearing a horrifying, satisfied grin. He continued posting about his journey on the forum as the SCP-5346 stalking situation escalated to a fever pitch. Jackson wouldn't actually make any further posts on the Parawatch forum after that. He seemed, for all intents and purposes, to have fallen off the map. Foundation agents who had been closely monitoring the situation decided to investigate, and when they were eventually able to find Jackson's home, they discovered that he had been dead for weeks. The cause of death was the same blunt force trauma to the cranium of all the other victims of SCP-5346. When the agents confiscated Jackson's phone, they also found a message in his drafts that he had clearly intended to post to the Parawatch forums before he had been killed. It read, I'm not crazy. I know I'm not. This thing is definitely onto me. I'm currently hiding in a closet, forcing myself not to burst into tears. I hear it walking around my hallways. It lingers, constantly surrounding me at all times. This thing is not gum. Hell, it's not even human. It's hungry. Whether it be for revenge or blood, I'm not exactly sure, but that doesn't matter now. I've called the police, but they won't be here in time to save me. Nor would they believe me if I told them about the monster that was hunting me down. I want to scream so badly. I'm too terrified to throw away my life that quickly. Please, do not fall down the rabbit hole. Save yourself, or it'll come for you too. Rage the Comic, signing out. Those same agents also found a note in Jackson's home, handwritten, that said, Mama always said to stand up to snitches. SCP-5346 is currently classified as uncontained because the sheer rarity of instances have made attempts to capture any kind of physical entity relating to 5346 a waste of Foundation resources. Instead, containment efforts on this anomaly are focused on finding and suppressing posts like the ones shown in this video, and getting to any affected individuals before SCP-5346 can cause them physical harm. To do your part in helping the Foundation contain SCP-5346, Exercise caution when obsessing over nostalgic films, because like a certain container full of confectionaries, you never know what you're going to get. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. 
It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go, good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it, and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets, just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. He picks it up and examines the cute animal print, remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch, or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you'd like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels, and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms, and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time, and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. 
Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment, and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. It's late at night and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, 
you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you, growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night, and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? Before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees. You can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body, just a few scraps of clothing and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature, by far, is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin. There are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin, which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns. It is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway, and will begin to chase or run straight towards them giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, 
They will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack, save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered, as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No lairs, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site-17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. A hand clasps around your throat cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. They age out of trick-or-treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. They age out of the sense of wonder, and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow, 
and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party. And before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment, an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, but the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet, but it doesn't say a word doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. Then, the screams go quiet, nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watch their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, 
but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to enter the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, 
Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again, and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096, and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 report some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. You're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semiohazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. 
If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. 2. An AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grabbed the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. It's not every day that the SCP Foundation opens a brand new site and appoints a new site director, but today is one of those days. Work is about to begin at Site 41, and a respected senior researcher has been appointed director of the brand new site. He hasn't been told much about it yet, but he knows a few things for certain. Some sort of new, highly volatile anomaly was discovered, a site was constructed around it, and his many years of loyalty to the organization have finally been rewarded with a promotion. As he takes his morning shower, his mind races, turning over the possibilities that this new chapter might bring. Is he up to the potential challenges? Just how dangerous is this new anomaly? What could possibly necessitate the building of a brand new site just to contain it? Whatever it is, these years of securing, containing, and protecting have prepared him. He's seen bizarre creatures, cursed places, and objects that defy the laws of physics. Whatever awaits him in his new position, he can handle it. He rinses the shampoo from his hair, letting his jitters flow down the drain with it, and switches off the water. He climbs out of the shower and turns to the foggy mirror. He sweeps a palm across the glass and meets his reflection's eyes. His serious expression catches him off guard, and he can't help but let his mind wander back to someone else who looked at him that way, with those stony gray eyes such a long time ago. He and his brother had never gotten along. Though they shared the same face, the same hair, and the same eyes, they couldn't have been more different. He was the screw-up, the one who couldn't focus in class and was always bumbling through life like a bull in a china shop. His brother was the golden boy, the star student who could do no wrong. As the boys got older, he tried to climb out of his brother's shadow and tried to live up to their parents' expectations, but anything he did, his brother could do better. He got into a great college, his brother got into Harvard. He got a job, his brother got a more impressive one. He got a Honda, his brother got a Mercedes. He fell in love with a girl, and his brother married her. It seemed like he would never stand on his own, never be anything but the lesser version of a perfect man, a nasty little homunculus who just happened to be wearing the graven image of something greater than himself. On the night of his brother's wedding, the festering resentment had finally come to the surface. He remembers the night in bits and pieces, a harsh word, a fifth drink, a broken champagne glass. His brother said something that went too far, cut too deep. Without thinking, he shoved him just a bit too hard. He watched his brother fall, watched his head hit the corner of the table. 
And then, he was still, silent. He thought about turning himself in, but then another thought crossed his mind. Why ruin two futures at once? His brother was gone. There was no coming back from that. Should he really spend the rest of his life in prison over a tragic mistake? It didn't seem fair. Instead, he planned. For once, he was grateful for the similarities between him and his brother. Their handwriting, for instance. He forged a note to his brother's new bride, telling her that he couldn't take the pressures of his life anymore. He was leaving, fleeing to Europe to start a new life, with a new name, and leaving all of his old ties behind. Then he packed his brother's body, the one that looked so much like his own, into a suitcase. He drove out into the woods, to a place they had once gotten lost as children, and he buried it so deep, no one would ever find it. He'd never forget how he felt that night, laboring away in the dark forest, face an unpleasant mess of snot and tears, the end of his shovel piercing the dirt again and again, until he'd made a big enough hole to consign the case that now held his own brother's mangled body. Every shovel full of dirt that he piled back on, hiding his sin, felt heavier than the last. What had he done? What the hell had he done? But by the time the grim deed was concluded, rationalizations had smoothed out the hard edges of his crime. There were a million reasons this was okay. This was justified. It was an accident, of course, that much was clear. But didn't his brother also have it coming, for flaunting his perfect life in his face for all these years? And who was the worthless chunk of dead meat now? The scales were balanced once more. No one would ever know what he did. No one but him, in those moments where he could see his brother in the mirror, reminding him of his greatest shame, no matter how hard he tried to forget. But that moment is long gone. He's back in the present now, grounding himself with a splash of cold water on his face. He shakes off the memories and dresses for the day. It's time to get to work. When he arrives at the facility, he's shocked by what he sees. It's a castle, grand and imposing, even if the years have not been particularly kind to it. The Foundation did not build this structure, though they've set up shop inside now. His reminiscence has made him late, and he hasn't even had a chance to look over his paperwork yet. But when you're a site director, what does it even matter if you're a little late? You're the boss, the head honcho. The party doesn't start until you walk in. Just the thought of it is enough to make his chest swell with pride. He will have to ask someone to fill him in, an eager subordinate who won't mind going over the basics of the new facility and what they are here to study. Like clockwork, a young assistant researcher scurries up to him, holding a clipboard and practically vibrating with energy. She clearly hasn't been working here long. There's still light behind her eyes. He thinks to himself, The things you see here will snuff that out soon enough, my dear. The assistant researcher leads him inside the castle, its guts ripped out and replaced with sleek modern technology. A stone staircase has been swapped out for a row of elevators, marble busts exchanged for security cameras and monitors. They enter one of the elevators, and the assistant presses the button for the lowest possible floor. They are going deep into the bowels of the castle, into the belly of the great beast. With a ding, the doors open, and they step out. The air down here has a peculiar smell, musty and dull, with a sharp metallic tang of dried blood. Along the wall, he can see a row of prison cells, eight of them to be precise, all shut tight. They're rusted and old, they've been here for quite some time. The Foundation didn't put these here. Of course, he realizes with a sinking feeling in his stomach that he can't quite explain, these cells themselves must be the anomaly he's here to supervise the containment of. He should have read the file before arriving, shouldn't have let himself get distracted, then he would know what he's walking into. So here we are, the assistant chirps, startling the man. He had almost forgotten she was standing next to him. Shall I give you the grand tour? She won't last long here with such a chipper attitude, he thinks, but he nods just the same. She walks ahead of him, referring dutifully to her clipboard as she goes. This is the first cell. As you can see, all of them are currently inactive. We'll be performing some tests later, though, and you'll hopefully get to see them in action. It's really something. She continues walking to the second cell. There are a lot of potential applications for this anomaly that, once we understand it, could be incredibly promising. He's only half listening as he trails behind her. As they near the third cell, the assistant glances back at him. I really look forward to working with you, sir. I've heard such great things. He opens his mouth to brush off the praise, to feign humility for her sake. When a sound startles him, the grind of metal against metal, the screech of a long disused door, the third cell is opening on its own. The assistant flips through her notes, growing pale. This isn't supposed to happen. This shouldn't be happening. She stammers, but he barely hears a word. He's staring, transfixed, at the darkness within. There's a rattling sound, like chains being dragged across a stone floor. What is about to be unleashed from this prison? He braces himself, remembering all of the near-death experiences he's faced down in the past. 
nothing could prepare him for what finally appears. A pair of iron shackles attached to lengths of chain shoot out from the shadows, headed right for him. A shackle clamps suddenly around each of his wrists, the cold metal tight enough to cut off the circulation, digging into his skin. Then, an invisible force on the other end of the chains begins to pull. He fights it, the shackles cutting into him as the assistant screams for help, but his efforts are futile. Whatever wants to pull him closer, whatever is trying to lock him away, it's far stronger than he could ever be. The chains yank him inside the cell, and the door slides shut behind him with a crash. He thinks for just a moment that he can see his brother laughing. Then, he's gone, leaving only an empty cell and a traumatized assistant behind. Sometimes the sins of the past come back to haunt you, and unfortunately for this particular man, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to SCP-567 or The Dungeon. In case the nickname wasn't clear enough, The Dungeon is not the sort of place you would ever want to be confined. SCP-567 is a series of eight cells located beneath Foundation Site 41. Each cell has a designated number from SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. Most of the time, the cells are inactive and indistinguishable from any ordinary prison cell. However, when someone that one of the cells deems to be guilty of a specific offense enters their proximity, the anomalous properties of SCP-567 become abundantly clear. Each cell punishes a specific horrible act. SCP-567-1 targets those who have committed theft. 2. Punishes sexual violence. 3 and 4 punish various types of murder. 5. Punishes adultery. 6 and 7. I'm afraid I can't quite make out what it says. Someone appears to have deliberately scratched out the text in the file. As for SCP-567-8, whatever wrongdoing it chooses to penalize is still unknown, and it is never activated in the entire time the Foundation has known of it. Every other cell is completely empty, but 567-8 contains one single, antique wooden chair in the center of the room, nailed to the floor. The purpose of this chair is unclear. When an individual who has committed one of the aforementioned acts comes within 2.5 meters of their corresponding cell door, a pair of shackles will shoot out from within the cell, seemingly materializing out of nowhere. These shackles will then lock around the individual's wrists and drag them inside at which point the cell door will slide itself closed and locked, and the prisoner and shackles will disappear. Multiple researchers have compared this anomaly, both in its function and its methodology, to SCP-1002, or Demisers, and SCP-2701, or True Solitary Confinement, which I have discussed at length before. Since the Foundation first contained SCP-567, only two prisoners have ever reappeared after being taken. 68 hours after he was first placed inside SCP-567-3, D-903912 escaped and was found collapsed on the ground just outside Site-41. He died only moments after reappearing, before any medical intervention could take place. An autopsy showed severe injuries, including lacerations, internal bleeding, and burns on his wrists and ankles. The second subject to ever return was D-937122, who was found 157 months after being locked in SCP-567-6. In spite of her injuries, which included head trauma, missing fingers, and the same burn marks on her wrists and ankles, this subject had a great deal more energy and attempted to attack the Foundation personnel that found her. She was subdued by several guards, restrained, and interrogated by an unnamed agent. Thankfully, an audio log of the interview was included in the file giving us a sense of what transpired. Please state your name, the agent began. D-937122 did not respond. Please state your name, they repeated. Again, no response. The agent sighed heavily and changed tactics. Look, I'm very sorry and I want to help you, but we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us, so please, please state your name for the record. At long last, the D-Class responded with an intense outburst. My name? You want to know my name? Screw my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But... but there is. I escaped. I got the medal off. None of the... And here the audio was corrupted to the point where I couldn't understand what was being said. After the interference clears, D-937122 could be heard shouting, I should be free! Let me go! A struggle followed as she attempted to escape custody. The agent then replied in an attempt to calm the D-Class down, I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to... Screw your opportunity! There is no opportunity! There is only escape! You called me a monster. Maybe I am one. But the nightmares, they... 
She briefly broke down into unintelligible mumbling before returning to normal speech. Compared to their crimes, I've done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. At this point, the D-Class became inconsolable, all coherent speech dissolving into sobs. The agent attempted to calm her down, but she remained hysterical. After several moments of sobbing, the D-Class began to gasp as if she was having difficulty breathing. She clutched her chest and began to go into apparent cardiac arrest. The agent attempted to administer CPR, but it was unsuccessful, and after a few minutes, she was dead. An autopsy was ordered following the interview, which revealed the apparent cause of her death. Her body was covered with tiny punctures, and a toxicology report revealed an unknown poison in her bloodstream. Though only two people have ever emerged from SCP-567, they were not the only organic life forms to break out of the dungeon cells. Every so often, the doors of a cell will open, and an entity will emerge. These creatures are given the designation SCP-567-9, and they are always aggressive. They do not usually match the description of any existing animal, instead appearing to be some sort of undiscovered creature. Once an instance of SCP-567-9 has escaped its cell, it will attempt to leave the dungeon and attack anything that gets in its way. The first instance of SCP-567-9 observed by the Foundation was a four-limbed creature approximately two meters in length. It walked on all fours, but had human-like hands on its front limbs, complete with opposable thumbs and sophisticated enough mobility to operate machinery. It was highly intelligent and used this intellect to take out 14 Foundation operatives before it was contained. The details of SCP-567-9-2 have been stricken from any official documentation. The only thing I can surmise from the file is that nine personnel were killed after it appeared, and one of the agents that helped contain it requested and received psychological counseling for what they experienced during the process. So whatever it was he encountered, it wasn't anything good. During a round of routine testing with SCP-567-4, while the cell door was open, an instance of SCP-567-9 appeared, attacking and killing the researcher leading the tests. The entity was not contained, but after seven casualties, was lured back towards its original cell. At this point, the cell deployed its shackles, and the creature was pulled back inside. The most recent instance of SCP-567-9 emerged when the door to SCP-567-7 opened and closed spontaneously. This was spotted on the CCTV footage, but none of the security monitoring the video could see anything leaving the cell. Two weeks later, an agent assigned to the dungeon was found dead in his home, still in bed. The circumstances of his death were virtually identical to those attributed to SCP-966, a nightmarish species of creature known as the Sleep Killer, which I've discussed here on the channel before. When the escaped entity was found in Site-41, it was found to resemble an instance of SCP-966, with only a few variations. It was successfully contained, and the on-site security cameras were upgraded to prepare for future anomalies like it. Though many specifics are missing from the file, including the exact appearances of the creature that emerged from the cells, I have deduced one thing. Wherever SCP-567 is transporting those it deems guilty, it is a prison for monsters of all species. Humans are not the only ones it wishes to hold accountable for their crimes. As I was reading about the dungeon and the various tests involving it, a rather morbid question came to mind. What would happen to a test subject guilty of more than one crime? Which cell would claim them? Well, fortunately for my curiosity, and unfortunately for him, one D-Class found out. D-834200 was used as a human test subject during initial studies of SCP-567. He was placed in front of SCP-567-6 and 7. Almost instantly, the cells rattled open, and the shackles shot out to grab him. His left wrist and ankle were ensnared by cell 6, and his right were trapped by cell 7. Then, he was pulled into both cells. Well, part of him was at least. How can I best explain his fate without causing too much distress? Have you ever held a wishbone in your hand at a family dinner while your sibling or cousin held the other side, and you both pulled until it broke? It was a bit like that. SCP Foundation Site-41 has been established in the abandoned castle that contains SCP-567 in order to prevent any civilians from coming across it. The entrance to the dungeon is kept sealed at all times, and the doors to each of the cells are monitored via CCTV. If any door is opened without authorization, Task Force Delta-9, also known as HACS, will be deployed to contain the resulting instance of SCP-567-9. If, for any reason, it cannot be contained, the task force is permitted to terminate. In order to prevent the unnecessary loss of any personnel, all applicants to join Task Force Delta-9 must have a clean criminal record, have never committed a crime at all, even at the behest of the Foundation, 
have a strong dedication to the law, and show loyalty to the social contract and the feelings of others. A robust moral compass is considered a vital qualification to work near SCP-567, lest they become simply one more victim added to its long list of tortured penitents. The Foundation has encountered many anomalies over the years that could pose a danger to the organization itself. SCP-567 is no exception. Untold numbers of Foundation operatives have committed terrible acts in the service of the greater good. They have lied, stolen, and even killed in order to protect and contain the secrets locked away in files and behind heavily guarded walls. A great deal of caution should be used when dealing with the dungeon, no matter how justified a person thinks their past sins might be. After all, there's no chance to plead your innocence, and the very prison that plans to hold you is also the judge, jury, and executioner. A businessman steps out of his hotel room holding a silver ice bucket. He looks up and down the empty hallway until he spots what he was searching for, an ice machine. He slips his room key into his pocket and heads down the hall towards the machine. As he waits for the machine to fill his bucket with ice, he glances around and spots something. There at the end of the hall, it looks like someone is sticking their head out from around the corner, watching him. But then they suddenly disappear. He doesn't think much of it. It's probably just some kid playing around. His ice bucket is only a quarter full. These old machines can be really slow. He looks around again and sees the same head poking around the corner, looking at him. He thinks it might be a young girl, but as he squints to get a better look, she disappears around the corner once again. The ice machine finally finishes filling his bucket. He picks it up and starts to walk back towards his room, but stops. He turns around and looks down the hall to see the same girl there again, watching him with a creepy, unblinking stare. Do you want something? The man asks down the hallway, but there's no response from the girl. She simply keeps looking at him. Are you just going to keep staring at me? That's exactly what she does. The businessman is really starting to get annoyed now. All he wanted to do was unwind with a drink after a long day at a job site. Why does this girl want to keep messing with him? He starts walking down the hall towards her. I don't know what you think you're playing at, the businessman says as he walks down the hallway in her direction. When he gets halfway to her, she disappears behind the corner once again. But the businessman keeps walking and talking to her. But if you don't stop messing with me, I'll… He rounds the corner and sees… nothing. There's a short hallway that leads to a maintenance closet, but no girl. Did she somehow slip inside the closet? He didn't hear the door, but she couldn't be anywhere else. He sets down the ice bucket on the floor and reaches towards the handle with more than a little apprehension. He feels uneasy for some reason, and huh? maybe even a little scared. Huh? But there's nothing to be afraid of. It was just a girl, wasn't it? He grabs the handle and opens the door. Aha! I've got you! There's nothing in the closet. Just a couple of mops, a bucket, and some cleaning supplies. He pushes the mops aside as if she could somehow be hiding behind them, but no. There's no place to hide or secret doors to be found. He really must have imagined the whole thing. It was a long day, and a long flight before that. He needed that drink. He sticks his room key into the door and pulls it out. A green light flashes and the lock clicks open. He grabs the handle to open the door, when he realizes he's forgotten something. The ice bucket, the whole reason he left his room to begin with. He walks back down the hallway and past the ice ma Wait a second. Where's the ice machine? Isn't this where it was? The alcove where he could have sworn he got ice just minutes before is empty. He looks around, up and down the hallway. Did he somehow get turned around? He walks to the end of the hall and turns the corner. Sitting there on the floor in front of the maintenance closet door is the ice bucket. He looks around, confusion on his face, and picks up the ice bucket. Back at his room, he puts his room key into the door. The lock flashes red. He tries the key again and once more it flashes red. He tries the key a third time, and as he does so, the door opens. He looks up to see a large man standing in front of him. Do you need something? The businessman is confused. What are you doing in my room? He asks. Your room? The large man responds. Yeah, room 237. The large man looks annoyed. He shoves past the businessman and points across the hall. The businessman follows his finger's direction to see that he's pointing at another door, one that has the number 237 next to it on the wall. The businessman looks at the number next to the door he's been trying to unlock, 239. The businessman laughs nervously at his mistake as the large man pushes past him again and closes the door behind him. Back in his room, the businessman can finally sit down and pour himself a drink. He takes two ice cubes from the bucket and drops them in his glass before taking a long sip. Ah. 
He turns on the TV, but after watching for a few minutes, he finds that he's having a hard time concentrating. Whatever this show is, it moves too fast and he can't keep track of what's happening. He turns off the TV and picks up a book instead. Maybe some reading will help him to relax and get his bearings. He still feels really… off. He opens the book, but gets confused. Is this the same book he bought in the airport? It looks like it's written in a foreign language. It's just a bunch of squiggles. He tosses the book on the table and yawns. It's not that late, but he's feeling really tired. He gets up, kicks off his shoes, and lies down on the bed without bothering to undress. He's too tired for that. He mumbles to himself for a moment, half awake, talking about how he needs to return that foreign book when he goes back to the airport. What were they trying to do selling him something he can't even read? He continues to mumble about the things he'll do to the cashier who sold him the book for a while until he finally drifts off to sleep. His eyes open. It's dark. He must have been sleeping for a while. The room is cold, too. He goes to pull the blankets up over him but immediately realizes that he can't move. Try as he might, his body won't respond. Not a single muscle. Only his eyes seem to work. He's completely paralyzed. He can't even yell for help. What happened? And what is he going to do? Did he have a stroke? Is he dying? As his mind races through all the different possibilities, he suddenly sees something. From his bed in the dark room, he can just barely make out the door to his hotel room, and he is terrified by what he can see coming through it. A figure has appeared in the door, literally in the door, as if it is phasing through the solid wood. The man is scared to death as the thing fully enters his room and turns to look right at him. The man wants to scream, but his mouth is still completely numb. The figure starts crawling towards him. He can see now that it's small, smooth, and completely white. He fights as hard as he can, willing his body to move, but nothing happens. He can't so much as whisper. The thing climbs up onto the bed and sits down right on his chest. He prays that he is dreaming, telling himself to wake up over and over again as the creature leans his face in close to his. It seems as if it is somehow looking at him with its smooth, eyeless sockets. It tilts its head slightly to the side and… Welcome, I'm Dr. Bob, and we couldn't be happier that you've decided to stay with us as we delve into SCP-5172, an extremely dangerous anomaly that is known by the extremely non-threatening name of… North American Hotel Ice Machines. SCP-5172 is a phenomenon that only affects guests staying at hotels located on the North American continent. It is unknown how or what causes these guests to become affected, but those that are will begin to notice something. Ice machines in the hallway of the hotel they are staying in. Now you might think this sounds perfectly normal. After all, don't most hotels have ice machines? If you just had this thought, then I have some bad news for you because there is a high probability that you too may have been affected by SCP-5172. You see, ice machines are actually extremely uncommon in hotels, and it is likely that you have never actually seen one, or at least not a real one. Allow me to explain. In the 1950s, the founder of the Holiday Inn chain of hotels, Kenan Williams, had an idea that he thought would set his hotel apart and attract customers, which was to offer more perks and amenities than his competitors. For example, he implemented a new policy where children would be allowed to stay for free, something most hotels charged extra for. Hotels at the time also had a policy of making their guests pay for ice, but Williams decided to change that by installing ice machines in his hotels. Sadly, the marketing stunt didn't work. The cost of the machines wasn't made up for in new customers, and the plan was discontinued by the mid-1960s. The vast majority of the machines were removed, with the rest being pulled from the hotels as they would break down since they were no longer worth the expense of maintaining. Despite the fact that they only existed in hotels for a brief period of time, there is still a widely held belief among the public that ice machines can be found in nearly every hotel. In a poll of the general population conducted by the Foundation, over 80% of adults claim to have memories of seeing an ice machine in a hotel, a number that is quite literally impossible. Just where this mass delusion came from, or why it persists, is currently unknown, but it's theorized to be related to the SCP-5172 phenomenon in some way. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-5172 in 1973 after a series of unsolved murders occurred at hotels in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Foundation investigators soon discovered the prevalence of false ice machine memories and installed a number of hidden cameras around the hotels in both their public spaces as well as in the rooms themselves. It was after viewing the footage captured by these cameras that the Foundation finally got their first look at just what happens during an occurrence of SCP-5172. 
which has been dubbed a Zalmana event. The Zalmana event is triggered whenever a guest at the hotel sees and then uses an ice machine. The moment they use the ice machine, the event cannot be stopped unless certain actions are taken, but more on that later. The targeted individual who used the ice machine will immediately begin to have the sense that they are being watched. This usually comes in the form of an unknown individual who appears to be looking at them from the end of the hall where the ice machine is located. Third-party observers are unable to see the person who is supposedly watching the target, nor do they appear on any recording devices, visual or otherwise. The targets have described the watchers in various ways, leading the Foundation to believe that they may actually be nothing more than hallucinations. Shortly after, the targeted individual will begin to experience feelings of confusion and fatigue, not dissimilar to the symptoms of early-stage dementia. The longer it takes the target to return to their hotel room, the more pronounced these feelings will become, and they will soon have issues completing everyday tasks and will experience short-term memory loss. Despite these feelings of fatigue and disorientation, Targets report that their mind feels too active to fall asleep, anywhere other than a hotel room bed, that is. This feeling will usually cause the target to seek out their own hotel room, though they may have difficulty finding it due to their confused state. They don't need to sleep in their own room for the next stage of the Zalmana event to be triggered, though. Sleeping in any hotel room will do. Once the target lies down in a hotel room bed, they will immediately enter the hypnagogic state, which is the confusing and dreamlike state that one experiences in between full sleep and waking. The temperature of the room will begin to lower during this period as well, until it reaches approximately 11 degrees Celsius or 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. After about an hour, the target will enter a state of deep sleep, at which point SCP-5172-1 will finally make its appearance. The humanoid-like entity is quite diminutive in size, standing just four feet tall and appearing to weigh a little over 60 pounds. Its arms are twice as long as normal humans, though, and the top of its head is enlarged as well. Though it is not visible to observers present in the room, cameras are able to record the creature. After phasing through the door of the hotel room, the 5172-1 entity will begin crawling towards the sleeping person, who will wake up to find that they are in a state of sleep paralysis. The entity will climb up onto the bed and sit on the person's chest. It will move its smooth-skinned face close to the targets before opening its mouth, revealing a long, thin, proboscis-like appendage that it inserts into the target's eye socket. It's long been theorized that it may be administering some type of paralytic or anesthesia directly into the brain, so that it can then engage in the next stage of the Zalmana event, harvesting. The 5172-1 entity's chest then opens to reveal a pair of tools. It will take the tools out of its chest and use them to begin extracting four centimeter cubes directly from the target's body. Flesh, muscle, organs, and even bone will all be cut and scooped out with the same ease, which it then places inside of its own chest cavity. While it starts the process extremely slow, collecting just two cubes per minute at first, it quickly ups its pace to as many as 50 cubes per minute, leading to the entire harvesting process typically lasting two to three hours. Once it has finished harvesting, the creature will simply place its tools back inside its chest cavity, crawl back towards the hotel room door, and phase through it once more. But the horror is far from over. SCP-5172-1 collects all of the organic material from the target during the harvesting process, all except for the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, the retinas, and the brain. These are left lying on the hotel room bed after 5172-1 carefully cut and scooped around them. And the truly horrifying aspect of the Zalmana event is that the target is still alive at this point and will continue to live for several more hours in this condition. Even worse, reports from targets who had the Zalmana event interrupted while in the middle of the harvesting process described being fully conscious the entire time. It now appears that the proboscis-like appendage that 5172-1 inserts into the target's eye does not appear to be an anesthetic agent at all, since the same rescued targets reported feeling excruciating pain. Instead, it seems that the purpose of the entity's appendage is to ensure that the victim stays conscious through the whole process, fully aware of each cube being removed from their body, helpless to do a thing to stop it. As mentioned, the triggering of a Zalmana event is not a guaranteed death sentence and can be stopped. While much faster than humans, SCP-5172-1 entities aren't especially strong and sustain damage much like a human would. Once it begins harvesting, the entity will become visible to others and can be terminated by the same methods that would kill a human, such as with gunshots or stab wounds. 
However, simply killing the entity isn't enough. The affected ice machine must be physically removed from the premises in order to prevent a new instance of SCP-5172-1 from materializing. Once triggered through the use of an affected ice machine, the only way to completely stop a Zalmana event is for the target to leave the hotel and sleep in a private residence, which will prevent SCP-5172-1 from appearing. If the target sleeps in any bed in the same or even a different hotel, the event will continue. Efforts are underway to better understand SCP-5172-1 entities by capturing a live specimen, but so far, all attempts have resulted in failure. Captured entities are capable of manifesting their tools and cutting out of containment, while all attempts at binding or otherwise tying down the creatures has led to them dying within several minutes. Autopsies of dead instances have revealed that, like us, they have a circulatory system, though its heart is located in its head, which explains how they can be killed by being shot or stabbed, but they lack respiratory and digestive organs. As you can imagine, the existence of SCP-5172 presents a problem for Foundation personnel and their business travel. Agents who must stay in hotels rather than SCP safe houses are briefed on the anomaly and required to wear heart rate monitors that can detect when an elevated heart rate occurs that may be connected to a Zalmana event. Social media, text messages, and other forms of communication from devices that are connected to hotel Wi-Fi systems are monitored at all times for any references to ice machines, and any mention triggers the dispatching of a containment team to the site who will attempt to identify and remove both the ice machine and the targeted individual from the premises. All ice machines discovered at locations thought to be affected by SCP-5172 are then relocated to Site-30. One final note, while SCP-5172 has long been thought to be a North American exclusive phenomenon, there has recently been one confirmed instance of an affected ice machine in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Making it even stranger is the fact that the Dutch do not seem to have the same mass public perception of the prevalence of hotel ice machines that North Americans do, and it is still unclear if this was a single isolated event or a sign that the Keter-class anomaly is spreading to other locations. Only time will tell. But in the meantime, even if you're staying outside of North America and want a frosty drink, consider paying the outrageous fees and grabbing an already cold one from the minibar. If you don't, you might find that you're paying for your refreshing beverage with much more than a pound of flesh. The old house has been abandoned for going on two decades. And as with any place that's been left uninhabited for this long, rumors tend to spiral. Of course, there are the more mundane explanations for why the two-story, four-bedroom home on the end of a nice street lays in semi-ruin. Black mold, asbestos, rising house prices. But those weren't the stories that most people told. Everyone in the neighborhood knew what really happened. All those years ago, the family that lived there had been murdered, and their killer was never caught. The three young paranormal investigators, with EMF readers in their hands and GoPro cameras mounted on their hard hats, know all about this. They approach the house in the dead of night, mumbling commentary for the recordings. If the old house really is as haunted as everyone says it is, then they could be in for something really good here. Their subscribers always loved brand new paranormal content. They use a crowbar to breach the front door and head inside. It's everything you can expect from a house that had been abandoned for 17 years. Dust, cobwebs, and graffiti abound, broken bottles scattered across the floor. Someone has scrawled, Welcome to Hell, above the door in faded sharpie. It all plays perfectly for the cameras. Paranormal content gold. All of them turn on their flashlights, generously provided to them by one of their sponsors, of course. But in this particular situation, they have no idea just how valuable their product really is. After all, there are some frightening things that hide in the dark. The leader of the trio begins ascending the stairs, narrating into his helmet cam, giving the more popular version of the house's legend. The perfect suburban family, torn apart, literally, by a killer hiding in their home. The family had all been brutally murdered by someone in their home, but the police never found any sign of unlawful entrance or exit. There were no clues to the killer's presence whatsoever, in fact. It was as if they were a ghost, a vapor. It was almost as though whoever killed the family had always been in that house, and even after the murders were committed, they never left the place either. As he tells the story, the lead investigator starts to feel a little nervous. Even though he himself doesn't really believe in the supernatural, he just plays up reactions for the views, he still can't help but wonder, should I really be here? Am I making a terrible mistake? Is there a chance that whatever did this all those years ago could still be in the house, waiting for me? 
but he pushes those thoughts from his mind. This gig is too valuable for him to wimp out now, and really, what are the chances that something actually dangerous would be lurking in the house? The other two investigators are still looking around downstairs, sticking together, their flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. Their boss always insists on going upstairs first. He demands the glory shot, after all. That leaves the rest of them searching the downstairs living room, dining room, and kitchen, where the best they can hope for is maybe a particularly haunted-looking dishwasher. It's why the younger of the two is so surprised huh? when they suddenly feel something happening to their body that they've never experienced before. In an instant, their whole body convulses with an involuntary shudder. They feel the temperature drop, and the world gets just that little bit darker. The best way they can describe the feeling is impending doom, like any moment now something terrible is going to happen. But almost as soon as the feeling begins, it's gone. Intensity dropping, the dread starting to dissipate, as though whoever or whatever caused this feeling literally passed right through them. Their fellow investigator asks them if they're okay. Of course. They nod and force a smile. They're fine. It's just a spooky place, is all. Atmosphere like this would get to anyone. Meanwhile, the lead investigator is exactly where he wants to be, ascending a rickety stepladder up into the attic. The very same attic where, all those years ago, the police had found what was left of the family. And from everything he'd read on the subject, their remains weren't a pretty sight, even by true crime enthusiast standards. He enters the attic and shines his flashlight around, capturing all the dusty old boxes left to rot in the cold. He's engrossed in the macabre spectacle of what had once been the worst and final moments of a group of strangers' very real lives. The attic is full of spider webs and shadows. They're so ubiquitous that as the lead investigator pauses to tell his camera the next chapter of the grisly tale, he doesn't even notice one of the shadows peeling off of the wall behind him. It wafts silently towards him, like a gust of midnight air. Little by little, the blob of shadow starts to take on a vaguely human shape. It leans forward in the investigator's direction, arms extended like a classic movie monster. Long, dark claws slide out of its shadowy hands. Downstairs, the other two investigators hear the most terrible scream. For a moment, the more fantastical thought crosses their minds. Could this be one of the tormented souls of the departed family, longing to be heard after years of silence? Then it occurs to them that they recognize the scream. It belongs to their boss. The two of them charge up the stairs, flashlights in hand, as the screaming starts to become more desperate than pained, like that of a wounded animal with its leg caught in a trap. Those terrible wails are echoing down from the open hatch leading into the attic. It's so dark up there, something must have broken his flashlight. That's when they notice something else. Red, dripping from the open hatch. For a moment, they hesitate, wondering what could be going on up there. Could they really help, or would they just be running into the danger themselves? But soon, their desire to save their boss's life overpowers their fear. They grab the ladder and start climbing, feeling the dripping blood on the worn wooden rungs. When they finally get up into the attic, it feels like the scream is coming from everywhere, bouncing off the walls in a terrible, echoing cacophony of pain. They turn in all directions, hovering their flashlight beams around the room in wide, sweeping arcs, until both fall on the source of all this terror. And when they see it, they can't help but scream too. The lead investigator's body is floating about a foot off the ground, his screams now fading into pained gurgles. Something huge and dark is lifting him up with one hand and sinking the long, dark claws of its other into his neck. The second the twin flashlight beams concentrate on the creature, it drops the lead investigator's bleeding body down onto the ground. His skin slate gray, his feeble twitching slowing to a halt as the last of his life drains from him. Two glowing red pinpricks open up in the face of the dark figure, eyes like terrible, burning coals etching themselves into their memory. Like smoke, it continues to glide backwards further, seeking refuge in the dark, a safe haven amongst the other shadows. By this point, the two surviving investigators know there's nothing they can do for their boss anymore. All that's left is to get out and survive. They have to save themselves. They turn, wasting no time running towards the exit. They don't notice it, but the second they turn the beams of their flashlights away, the shadow's terrible eyes disappear and it starts advancing towards them again, its claws outstretched and grasping for them with awful fury. The shadow creature grabs at their heads as they make their final leap for the exit. However, all the monster can pull away are their helmets and helmet cams as they scramble down the ladder and then down the stairs, running at speeds they didn't even think possible as the shadow slithers down behind them. It doesn't give up. It wants their lives. It wants their warm human blood on its claws. 
They clear the threshold of the accursed house and keep running to their car. One looks over their shoulder and sees the shadow leave the house, gaining on them, both claws outstretched and ready to rend their flesh. The two climb into their car. They see the shadow coming towards their window. It's moving so quickly, only a few feet away now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Ignition. The car starts up and the driver smashes the pedal down. They take off, quickly accelerating up to illegal speeds as the shadow continues to chase, slowly getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A distant nightmare. A terrible, dark ghost. As it finally disappears, they feel a moment of safety. But really, only a moment. Because it occurs to them then that they cannot say, with any confidence, that this monster won't just be waiting for them when they get home. SCP-280, also known as Eyes in the Dark, is one of the more frightening and dangerous anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Of course, it likely won't be causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon, but if you happen to run into this nocturnal monster, it's likely to cause an end-of-you scenario and remove you from the world with extreme prejudice. There's no way of telling just how many lives it claimed before the SCP Foundation finally got it into containment, and perhaps it's best to just not think about that. SCP-280 is a black wraith-like apparition that floats at roughly average human height, with no visible legs or feet, as the lower portion of its body simply fades away before it reaches the ground. In its dormant state, the entity may appear to be little more than a shadow, easily dismissed, especially in dark environments. This comes as a natural result of the being's frightening ability to become intangible at will, and only become physical when it enters a state of active aggression toward a human target. In this intangible state, victims have even been known to walk through the shadowy mass by accident. While this doesn't lead to any detrimental physical effects, victims report that being inside the creature can lead to heightened states of anxiety, fear, and dread. Despite its body being wholly composed of an unidentifiable black matter, when exposed to light, the creature does begin to express a pair of glowing dots on its head similar to eyes, hence its frightening nickname. However, all tests indicate that these eyes aren't actually functional. Instead, they appear to be a kind of defensive measure, like false eyes on the carapace of an insect. These eyes are never shown when SCP-280 is advancing towards a victim, only when it is in retreat, though this is only one of the entity's several defensive responses. If an area where the creature is residing becomes fully illuminated, or a sudden flash of extremely bright light is directed against it, then it will immediately dematerialize and appear in a different area. The one positive thing that can be said about the hunting patterns of SCP-280 is that they're relatively predictable. The entity, it seems, only has an interest in human beings. When it selects a target, it will pursue them relentlessly, approaching in its intangible form with its arms extended in what many describe as a sleepwalker pose. In this state, you may finally notice 280's claws, long, thin, and razor sharp. It may silently approach while the victim is turned the other way, or while they sleep soundly in bed, or even when they're paralyzed in fear at the very sight of it. When SCP-280 closes the distance, it will begin to rip and tear at its victims with its claws, causing massive physical trauma and, in some cases, death. Attacks range from one to five minutes of being relentlessly clawed at by the beast. When the attack is over, it will simply expose its eyes, become intangible once more, and escape you will not be able to overpower the creature. Foundation tests have shown that it has extreme physical strength, and it's capable of tearing apart solid steel with little effort. If it can't find any humans to victimize, then it will simply remain dormant, pressing itself up against a wall, in a dark corner, or within some other structure. Which is why, if ever you feel nervous about a certain dark corner in a room near you, it is best to remove yourself from the situation as quickly as possible and remain in a brightly lit area. It would perhaps be comforting to believe that SCP-280 is acting on some twisted form of animal instinct. After all, while the results may seem horrific to us, every organism has to eat, right? Well, sadly, that isn't the case here. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, sleep, or breathe to survive, and it never consumes any of the matter torn from its victims. The best working theory is that the entity simply enjoys the harm it causes, taking a degree of perverse pleasure in hunting down and murdering its targets. There is no better nature to appeal to here. The SCP Foundation's ability to study the creature's biology has also been stunted, in part due to the creature's highly aggressive nature, and also the fact that its selective intangibility makes gaining physical samples almost impossible. Even capturing and containing the creature in the first place came partially out of blind luck. 
It first came to Foundation attention after a series of mysterious locked door murders in a small Mississippi township. In the most recent case, an entire family had been brutally murdered in their home, leaving only one survivor. A traumatized nine-year-old boy named David who'd locked himself in the basement when he started to hear the screaming. He was so terrified by the things he saw that night that he remained in a catatonic state for weeks afterwards, completely unresponsive to outside stimulus. But one little detail saved his life. A flashlight was clasped in his white knuckle grip, shining a bright beam of cold, white light onwards. When David was removed and placed into medical care, officers began searching the building for any kind of clues as to how the other four family members were murdered. However, during this investigation, the police were just as vulnerable as the victims who'd been so recently slain. While one officer was wandering around the attic, looking for any evidence they may have missed, SCP-280 emerged from the darkness and attacked tearing into his body with its long, deadly claws. Luckily for the officer in question, he survived the incident, though he was badly wounded. His report on the matter, including the ardent claim that he was attacked by a being, quote, made from black smoke, caught the attention of SCP Foundation operatives embedded in the precinct. They soon took over the investigation and descended on the house, hoping to tag and bag whatever had been behind all these deaths. This would be easier said than done. While Foundation field agents canvassed the home, they simply walked past the creature multiple times, discounting it as a mere shadow. After all, it only had these easily identifiable glowing eyes when it was in a retreating position. Even when it entered its physical state, operatives brushing up against it generally dismissed the sensation as hair, clothing, or some other object touching them in the dark. This already bungled investigation got even worse when the Foundation decided to introduce high-intensity lights into the equation, hopefully flushing the creature out. This, of course, only caused it to dematerialize and appear elsewhere. The chase ended in an almost farcical fashion, a cavalcade of Foundation agents chasing a cloud of sneering black smoke across a Mississippi field at 2.30 a.m. Thankfully for the human race, the entity was, at the very least, eventually secured and contained. However, this wouldn't be the last time it was out of containment. During a series of tests with different types of illumination, intending to test SCP-280's reflexes, it disappeared from its chamber. It seemed almost to sink through the different levels of the illuminated site before coming to rest at the containment chamber holding SCP-1591. This made for a fascinating accidental cross-test. You see, SCP-1591, to put it simply, is a unique sculpture of a star that emits an incredibly bright light and this light will slowly make any being subject to its glow intangible before disappearing completely. When SCP-280 came before SCP-1591, it displayed its eyes but did not retreat. In fact, it assumed a kneeling position and simply remained before the anomalous sculpture until it faded from existence. It then re-manifested in its own containment chamber several hours later without incident. All things considered, it went pretty well as far as containment breaches involving deadly, human-hating monsters go. Because of its ability to demanifest and phase through solid objects, SCP-280 is incredibly difficult to contain, earning it the dreaded Keter object class. In order to avoid the risk of demanifestation, SCP-280 is contained in a 5 by 5 meter cell that is perpetually left in a state of total darkness. No equipment is to be left in the cell unsupervised at any time, and any items brought into the cell for testing must be removed when the testing is complete. Any staff members entering the chamber for tests must be equipped with infrared goggles, an infrared ID strobe, and also a strong flashlight to ward the creature off in the case that it becomes aggressive. If SCP-280 does attempt to attack anyone in the chamber, all attending staff are instructed to turn on their flashlights and turn the beams against the creature. No aggressive action is permitted, and staff members must remain at least one meter away from SCP-280 at all times for their own safety. And if you suddenly feel yourself getting a little nervous in an eerily dark room, I'd like you to remember this. The one thing more frightening than seeing eyes in the dark is not seeing them. A child is sleeping happily in their bed, dreaming of Christmas morning. What they don't hear as they sleep is the sound of SCP-4666 slipping into their room. SCP-4666 watches the child for just a moment before reaching into a giant bag. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man. SCP-4666 is thought to be a single humanoid entity, but one that has been alive for an incredibly long time. 
Those who have come into contact with SCP-4666 and live to tell the tale describe him as being very tall, between 2 and 2.3 meters. He also appears to be very old and very thin. He always appears without clothing, even when the weather is below freezing and would be much too cold for any normal human to survive. Though the true extent of his anomalous properties are still unknown, SCP-4666 seems to be able to travel instantaneously to any location on Earth above the 40th line of North Latitude, and may actually be able to travel anywhere on the planet. Encounters with SCP-4666 have only been reported during a very specific time of year, a period of 12 nights running from the night of December 21st to the early morning hours of January 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase, and the encounters with the anomalous humanoid creature have been termed Weissnacht events. During these events, SCP-4666 appears at family dwellings, all of which, so far, have a few things in common. 1. They are all isolated in rural areas. 2. They are in locations with snow that covers the area for the duration of the event. And 3. They are all home to a family with at least one child under the age of 8. In places that match all of those characteristics, Weissnacht events sometimes occur and always follow the same basic progression. During the first seven nights, the children will report seeing a strange figure within the vicinity of the home. The entity will seem to be watching the home from a distance, such as from across a field or from the edge of a nearby forest. Some children have even reported waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. On nights 8 through 11, other family members will report hearing the entity, such as footsteps on the roof or in the attic. A bad-smelling odor will also start to be noticed in the house, but no source of the smell is ever found. These strange occurrences will often lead the family to think their house may be haunted, or that they're being terrorized by a madman. Finally, on the twelfth night, one of two scenarios can occur. In the first, which happens roughly 15% of the time, Families will often report that they heard footsteps during the night inside of their house, but there is never any sign of forced entry like broken windows or doors. In the morning, the children will find crudely made toys at the foot of their beds. For the lucky ones, this is the end of the Weissnacht event for them. The roughly 85% who experience the other scenario are considerably less lucky. In the vast majority of cases, the twelfth night is a horrible experience. SCP-4666 still enters the home on the final night, but rather than leave presents for the children, it incapacitates the family and moves them all into a single room where it proceeds to kill them one by one in view of the rest of the family. The exact method of killing varies from event to event, but there's almost always an element of torture that occurs before they are finally killed and this torture may serve a ritualistic purpose. The entire family is killed except for one of the children who is under the age of eight. This child is instead abducted and placed into a giant bag SCP-4666 carries with it. SCP-4666's existence was first noted in 1974 by the Foundation's then new Anomalous Signature Recognition Program which alerted the Foundation to several suspiciously similar home invasions and murders that occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere on the night of January 1st. Further research uncovered evidence for what was most likely other Weissnacht events every single year, dating back all the way to the late 18th century, with there being, on average, a little more than three events per year. And there's even been evidence of references to what may be SCP-4666 dating all the way back to the 1st and 2nd century AD. Identical fingerprints have been found at all of the houses which match the conditions for Weissnacht events, and have been matched to a recovered partial print from all the way back in 1873. These fingerprints have characteristics that don't match any known human fingerprints, and the human-like white hairs that have also been recovered do not appear to contain human DNA, or any DNA at all for that matter. In the rare Weissnacht events where SCP-4666 does not murder the family and gifts are left behind, the gifts are anything but normal. 
The gifts, known as SCP-4666-As, appear to be made from the bodies of children that SCP-4666 abducted from other homes. In one case, from 2018, at the home of a family in Alaska, a life-size doll made from the body of a female child was left behind. The doll was wearing a dirty dress made from sewn-together rags that was in some places sewn directly to the skin. Her mouth had been sewn shut and painted red with human blood. Another child's fingernails had been glued over her own, and three fingers were missing completely. The scalp had also been replaced with another child's scalp and hair like a crude wig. Worst of all, both eyes had been removed and replaced with two stones which were painted to look like eyes. But most frightening of all was that the child who had been turned into a doll was somehow still alive. Authorities took the girl to a hospital where she was able to give a brief interview. She explained that the man who abducted her had killed her parents before putting her into a giant bag where there were other children too. SCP-4666 took the children somewhere deep below the earth in a cave system full of ice and bones. There, they were forced to make crude toys until they couldn't go on any longer, at which point they became toys. The girl, now known to be Ekaterina Morozova, had been abducted two years previously in a known Weissnacht event. She survived for only 18 hours after being discovered. An autopsy revealed many terrible injuries, and the cause of death was found to be from severe, sustained malnourishment. SCP-4666 has been classified as Keter and is currently not contained. The Foundation monitors web traffic and law enforcement channels for any evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and especially any potential Weissnacht events, such as cases of stalking reported during the 12-night active phase or other strange phenomena at houses with young children. Should a Weissnacht event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is dispatched to attempt to contain SCP-4666 using the standard PDP-8 humanoid first contact protocols. So far, no such containment attempt has been successful. The group of children on their bikes stare intently at the large, abandoned house. Rumors have been circulating all school year about a monster that lives inside. One child tells the others about the kid from a couple towns over who went inside and never came back out, and it's easy to believe that something evil could be lurking inside the rundown home with its peeling paint and many broken windows. The children begin teasing each other, daring one another to go in and see the monster for themselves. No one seems especially eager to volunteer, though, as they all egg each other on. As the group of children joke about who should be forced to go inside, another comes riding up behind them, struggling to catch his breath. You left me behind again! he complains. Clearly, this is not the first time that this smallest child of the group has been made to try and keep up with his bigger and faster friends. The bigger kids all turn to look at him. They don't need to discuss it any further. The answer to who must go inside has already been decided. The smaller child tries to protest, but ultimately, what decision does he have but to go inside? He can't let everyone else think that he's a chicken. He's got to prove once and for all that he's just as tough as any of them. Without another word, he lets his bike fall into the dirt and makes his way towards the big, creepy house. The door pushes open without any resistance, and the boy looks into the dark house. The boy steps inside, and the floorboards creak loudly under his feet. The inside looks much like the outside, old, worn, and abandoned. But then, he hears something, a scratching noise coming from above him. He turns to leave, but he can see all of his friends through the doorway, and they motion for him to keep going. The boy steals his nerves and turns back. He's going to show them just how brave he is. The boy starts up the stairs, each one groaning as he steps onto it. He reaches the top of the stairs to find a landing with more rooms, each full of dirt and debris. There's spray paint on many of the walls and lots of trash. It looks like teens may use this as a place to hang out. But there at the other side of the landing is one more room, and the door is shut. From outside, the group of children can see through the upper windows as the boy makes his way through the house. They're not laughing and teasing any longer. In fact, they're impressed by how bravely he is exploring the old home. Though none of them would admit it out loud, he's earning their respect. The boy reaches the shut door at the end of the hall and presses his ear to it, but he doesn't hear anything inside. He places his hand on the doorknob and slowly opens it. The boy screams and falls backwards as the cat that was hiding inside panics and jumps through one of the open windows. 
The boy can't help but laugh. Of course it was just a... The boy screams again as the floor gives way beneath him and he crashes down onto the first floor in a pile of debris. He's stunned by the fall before starting to scream again as that floor gives way too. His yelling is silenced by the air being knocked out of him as he hits the basement floor. He's covered in dust and pieces of two floors he fell through. He feels bruised and sore, but he can wiggle his fingers and toes. He's not paralyzed, and it doesn't even feel like he's broken a bone. Maybe he's okay. But no, he's definitely not okay. Because suddenly, there's something picking him up off the floor. As his eyes adjust to the dark basement, he sees what it is that's holding him. It's half man, half machine, a huge disgusting mix of metal and flesh. The boy is too scared to scream anymore as the creature's unmoving, dead-looking eyes stare straight into his. Its face looks as though the skin has been stretched across a human metallic skull. The boy can only watch as the monster raises its sharp, metallic fingers and brushes the dirt out of the boy's hair. The boy starts to whimper, but whatever this thing is, it doesn't seem to want to hurt him. A tinny, robotic voice coming from a small device on the creature's face suddenly breaks the silence. Al-Anta ala mayuram. The boy doesn't understand, but the robotic man tilts his horrific head to the side and repeats the same thing. The boy is still confused, but he feels like the robot is trying to tell him something. He somehow gets the sense that it's not going to hurt him. Is this the monster that everyone has been afraid of? A misunderstood machine man living down here in the basement? The robot flinches as something is smashed on the back of his head. He tosses the boy to the side and turns to see the boy's friends, each of them armed with pieces of wood and other scraps as weapons. They've come here to save their friend from the monster that they dared him to find. Another runs up to strike the robot, but before he can reach him, he falls to his knees in pain, as do the rest of the children. The creature has begun emitting a high-frequency noise, and the children try to cover their ears. They all feel a searing pain that makes it feel as though their heads will explode. The piercing noise continues to ring out, but the monster looks like it has entered some kind of dormant state and is no longer moving. The small boy is able to slowly get back to his knees, hands still clasped to the side of his head, and stand up. He runs past the monster and his friends who are writhing on the floor in pain, up the stairs and out of the old house. A woman stands at a kitchen counter, chopping vegetables for their dinner that evening, and talking to her oldest daughter about her plans for that weekend, when the back door suddenly bursts open. Standing there is her son, the small boy. He's barely able to whisper the words, Monster! There's a monster in the basement! Before he collapses, blood pouring from his ears and nose, before he begins convulsing on the floor. At the local police station, an officer is speaking on the phone. I see. Yes, that is quite strange. A metal man? You don't say. I'll send someone out there right away. Don't go anywhere. The police officer hangs up the phone and looks around, making sure no one is nearby or listening to him, and then takes out a cell phone. He dials a number from memory, and someone answers on the other end almost immediately. Yes, this is Field Agent Patch, the police officer says. You need to get a containment team out here right away, and a good one too. I don't know what it is, but it's dangerous. An SCP Foundation mobile task force that specializes in containing dangerous humanoid threats soon arrived at the house and took the anomaly into captivity. Misinformation teams concocted a cover story about a gas leak leading to the unfortunate deaths of several of the town's children and administering amnestics to any potential witnesses. Once the messy business of containment was over, though, it was time to figure out just what this strange creature was. SCP-203 appears to have at one time been a Caucasian human male, though its appearance now is far different than it once was. This bipedal humanoid creature stands 2.5 meters tall and weighs roughly 200 kilograms. Both its incredible height and weight are due to the fact that the man's original skeleton has been entirely removed and replaced with a mechanical framework made of cast iron. The metal skeleton is much larger than the original bones, and in many places SCP-203's skin has split from being stretched over it, revealing the mechanical structure underneath. Other parts of the framework appear to have been intentionally made to protrude through the skin, though it is unclear for what purpose. In addition to this larger-than-normal mechanical skeleton, a number of other augmentations are present on SCP-203. Its fingers have been extended into sharpened, hook-like barbs that are approximately one meter long. Its lips have been removed entirely, making it clear that there is no movable jawbone and that the skull is likely one large hollow piece of metal and there are several more hook-like protrusions jutting out around the mouth area, smaller but similar in appearance to the fingers. SCP-203's legs have been modified as well, 
with two added joints that give them an appearance more akin to a dog's, and its toes have been removed and replaced with a solid piece of metal similar to those found in steel-toed boots. Its chest has no sternum or breastplate, which causes the skin stretched across to pull inward as its diaphragm contracts. Its ears have also been removed, though it still seems to possess hearing that is far beyond that of an average human. And while its eyes still remain, they are held in a permanently forward-facing position by several needles that emerge from the eye sockets. The irises also appear permanently dilated and do not react to light. In place of a mouth is a small speaker covered by a metal grate that is capable of producing basic vocalizations, though with a distinctly robotic sound to them. Tests have shown that SCP-203 has a basic understanding of English, but its own primary language seems to be a type of Arabic, though there are no records of the exact dialect. SCP-203 does not need to eat or drink, and without any visible mouth, it is likely incapable of either. Instead, it runs off of a power cell located within its body that will provide energy for up to 72 hours. After those three days, SCP-203 will shut down and enter a hibernation state for three to four hours, during which its power source will recharge, providing it with another 72 hours of energy. All attempts to examine SCP-203 by either X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and other forms of diagnostic imagery have failed, and attempts at exploratory surgery have triggered its defense mechanisms which are both painful and deadly. When it perceives that it is being threatened in some way, SCP-203 is capable of emitting a high-frequency droning sound that has a profoundly damaging effect on the human nervous system. The effects of this defense mechanism were able to be observed directly when a D-Class personnel accidentally struck SCP-203 and its droning sound was activated. Immediately after being exposed to the sound, D-104 experienced a severe headache. After 15 minutes, the headache grew worse and D-104 began to bleed from the ears. After a half hour, the D-Class who had now gone to the infirmary began to experience seizures and was bleeding from all of his orifices. Ten minutes later, the D-Class was dead. Another test was performed, and the results were nearly identical, with symptoms progressing at roughly the same rate. However, this time, rather than move the D-Class to the infirmary, it was kept in the cell with SCP-203. After 40 minutes, the D-Class was dead, and a few minutes later, 203 finally ceased its droning sound. SCP-203 then approached the body of the deceased D-Class and began to use its own augmentations to start removing the skeleton of the D-Class. While SCP-203 was stopped before it could complete its task, it now appears that the droning sound it produces is a defense mechanism but may also be a part of the process by which it creates new instances of SCP-203. In interviews with SCP-203, it claims to have no memories of its life prior to its augmentation. It says that it now exists in a near constant state of pain and confusion and that the times when its battery is expended and it enters a rest state are its only escape from the pain of its existence. It also claims that it has no memory of what happens once its defense mechanism is activated, nor does it remember what it did to the body of the D-Class that was left in its cell. However, it is unknown just how truthful SCP-203 is being. There has been no way to verify anything that SCP-203 tells researchers, and for the time being, its statements are to be regarded by Foundation staff as an attempt to elicit sympathy or otherwise manipulate them emotionally. It's made several requests for pain-killing medication and anesthetics, but so far, all of these requests have been denied. SCP-203 has been classified as Euclid, and it is kept in a specialized storage bunker at a research site. Two D-Class personnel equipped with sound filtering equipment guard it at all times, and it is accompanied by an armed escort to any testing or research sessions. Is SCP-203 the ultimate victim? A normal human that was transformed against his will into a crude amalgamation of man and machine? Maybe there is something more to SCP-203, or rather, less. Is SCP-203 fooling all of us? Is this tortured iron soul nothing more than a metallic monster disguising itself with the skin of its last victim? Perhaps with more research, we will one day know the answer. Introducing Tamagotchi. Are your parents super lame and refusing to buy you a pet? Well, eat my shorts, mom and dad. With the all new Tamagotchi, you can have the best pet you could ever ask for. Living in the Digisphere in your pocket. With three simple buttons and a chain to hang your keyrings on, you can make your Tamagotchi your own. Care for it day and night, watch them sleep, play bodacious games, and make sure you keep an eye out for if they need to go to the toilet. P.U. Throw it in your backpack and take it to school. Just don't let your teacher catch you. Oh snap! 
Tamagotchis are da bomb. Bet you really want to go and buy one now, don't you? The detective throws her bag onto the couch. She wanted nothing more than to have thrown it off as soon as she walked through the door, but if anything in it broke, she'd be screwed. They don't have the money for rent at the moment, can't be adding additional costs onto that. Her boyfriend barely glances up at her from the couch, still wearing the same blue t-shirt he'd worn to bed last night and with a packet of Doritos next to him. It's pretty obvious how he spent his day. The TV switches to another commercial. She taps him gently on the shoulder, offering him a warm smile. He jumps a little, seeming to come out of a little reverie. Affection fills his eyes as soon as he sets them on her. He hastily brushes Doritos dust off his hands and holds them up, tapping out words in sign language. Sorry, I zoned out. How was your day? The detective sinks into her usual spot on the couch and snuggles up next to him, nuzzling her head into his neck. After a quick hug, she untangles her hands and signs her reply. Long. He kisses her on her forehead. She goes on to tell him all about the case she's been working on. It's more of a hunch at this point than a case, really. There's been a big spree of shopliftings, burglaries, and muggings over the last couple of months. A significant uptick from this time last year, but everyone is at a loss to figure out why. She's having to spend a lot more on gas driving around to break-ins at the moment. Her boyfriend watches her hands recount the events with a tender look of concern on his face. Don't worry, she signs. I'll make sure they reimburse me for the gas. He nods and seems to relax a little. She hesitates before signing the next bit. Did you do any job applications today? Her boyfriend sighs and shakes his head. He looks ready to be told off, but instead, she gives him a big cuddle. Something in him seems to break, and after a moment, she can feel him shaking in her arms. Even though she can't hear him, the detective knows her boyfriend well enough to know that he is crying. She pulls away from him and makes firm, reassuring eye contact with him before signing. It's okay. We can do the next one together if that would be easier. And so the two of them do that. They cook dinner together, her boyfriend listening to the radio while she enjoys the feeling of the bass in her chest. Then, once everything is washed up and the apartment is dark and cozy, they sit down at their kitchen table and handwrite a cover letter. They would have typed it up on their Macintosh, but they'd sold that and their printer a few months ago to cover their utility bills. But handwriting is okay too. Her boyfriend had been working at Dell when they met, 1993, the height of the dot-com boom, when any kid with a math degree and a keyboard could shoot up the ladders in tech giants across the country. Two years later, that bubble burst, and he'd lost his job. Fiercely smart and incredibly kind, her boyfriend hadn't been able to find work for around 13 months now. Every day, the detective's heart broke a little more to see how low his confidence was dipping. He was an amazing person, by far the most exceptional guy she'd ever met and ever would meet and yet the constant rejection letters, failed interviews, and lack of options had steadily worn him down to a delicate and exhausted ghost of himself. But that only makes her want to love and support him even more. He scrawls a signature at the bottom of the cover letter, and they carefully fold it along with his resume and slide them both into an envelope. She cuddles him from behind and gives him a gross wet kiss on his cheek, enough to make him giggle. There, at least he's got one happy moment from today. He turns to her and grins, raising his hands to talk to her. I might buy a Tamagotchi. A what? The commercial on TV, it was playing when you got home. I really want one. Can I buy one? A little twinge pulls at her heart. She really ought to say no. Money is so tight at the moment with them both relying on her income. And it's hard to... Nah, what is she saying? He's clearly going through a lot right now, and maybe something fun would be good for him. Even if it does just look like some silly kid's toy from Japan. She raises her hands. Of course you can. And the pair of them go back over to the TV and flick it on. The next day is a bit of a blur. It's the detective's first day on yet another shoplifting, her first foray into fashion. Pairs of Air Jordans on display had been stolen, smashed glass everywhere. The thieves had left all the cash in the register. A couple other items were missing too, all very hip stuff. Tie-dye shirts, Jenko jeans, a lot of camouflage, that kind of thing. Stuff that's on TV and the radio all the time at the moment. By the time the detective gets out, she's only got 10 minutes to rush to Toys R Us before it closes. Thankfully, the Tamagotchi display is right by the front entrance. Almost totally sold out, but with one lone box left, she snatches it up and cheerfully takes it to the cash register. As she walks out of the store and looks down at the box in her hands, she can't help but wonder, why the hell would her boyfriend want to play with a little children's toy? As soon as the detective opens the door to her apartment, she is struck by a change. Instead of sitting on the couch watching TV, 
Her boyfriend is in the kitchen, radio belting out at full volume. Her heart flutters. Could it be? Has he heard back from one of his jobs? He sticks a head out from around the kitchen door and grins at her, beckoning her inside. She grins back, quickly hiding the Toys R Us bag behind her back. It smells amazing in here. Onions and garlic, oregano, rich tomatoes, a hint of wine in the sauce. He's really gone all out making her favorite chili for dinner tonight. He waves her over to the pan and motions for her to take a deep smell. She does, enjoying all of the aromas filling the air. There's something smoky in there too, a new smell she doesn't recognize. She turns to her boyfriend quizzically. He grins and explains to her in sign language that it's charred peppers, held over the flames on the hob just long enough to blacken and then thrown into the food processor to... Hang on, she interrupts him. We don't have a food processor. Her boyfriend grins proudly and steps to one side to reveal a brand new shining food processor sitting proudly on their countertop. He explains to her that he bought it that day. It has 10 speed settings, multiple blades you can switch out, a miniature container for spice blends, and she stops him again. How much did this cost? He looks sheepish. A wave of realization crosses his eyes, and he looks back at it guiltily. I just really wanted it, he signs. Thought it would make a nice romantic dinner for us. The detective softens. Of course, he was just trying to make the effort for her. It wasn't fair of her to tell him off for doing that. Opening the Toys R Us bag, she pulls out the Tamagotchi and holds it out to him. Compared to this expensive food processor, her gift looks pretty insignificant, but her boyfriend's face lights up straight away. He grabs it off her and rips the toy out of the packaging in a frenzy. His eyes shine and dance around as he hatches his first Tamagotchi. He looks like a child on Christmas Day. She can't help but join in laughing with him as they go to sit on the couch and watch some TV together. But the next day, when the detective gets home, she notices a hole in their wall a literal hole. Their landline is missing. Her boyfriend's face pops out from around the corner, just as it did the previous day, with that same grin. Only this time, he's brandishing a brand new cell phone in his outstretched arm. It's tiny, about the size of a brick, with the name Nokia emblazoned across the top. That can't have been cheap. This time, she doesn't share in his excitement. Indeed, the next day, she can't even muster up a smile when he proudly demonstrates the alarm on his new G-Shock, laced up his new Jordans, and started excitedly flipping through his box set of R.L. Stein books. That is enough. She can't deal with this anymore. She's been struggling so hard to make ends meet. Meanwhile, he's throwing away hundreds of dollars on products he had never mentioned before. She snaps. It can be very frustrating being mute because you can't shout to let your anger out. All that energy instead goes into her sign language, her hands swinging and slapping into each other as her face contorts. What's wrong with him? Why is he being like this? She's doing everything she can to keep a roof over their heads, while he's just throwing all of her money down the drain. How could he be so cruel? The more she rants, the more guilty her boyfriend's face becomes. Tears fill his eyes, his bottom lip starts to tremble, and before long, he is bawling in front of her. Can't keep going, not seeing him like this. Her hands fall limply to her sides. After a moment, he raises a sniffling face to her and signs something simple back. It's the TV. The commercials, they're just too persuasive. She snorts a laugh. And that's it. If he's not going to give her a serious answer, she's not going to have a serious conversation. She storms off up to bed, leaving him alone downstairs. He switches the TV off. That next day, she wakes up to breakfast in bed, but no sign of her boyfriend. She doesn't touch any of it, getting a coffee and croissant on her way into work instead from this up-and-coming coffee place called Starbucks. Today is a chance for her to take her mind off things. She's at a crime scene in a poor neighborhood. The previous night, the man who lived there had been sitting downstairs with his blinds open out to the street. He'd noticed a suspicious figure walking past who'd peered in through the glass. Before he knew what was happening, a brick crashed through his window and the burglar was in his home, running from room to room, ransacking the place and trying to make off with different items from the house. The homeowner had run to his gun safe and shot the burglar in the back four times. The crime scene investigation was mostly a formality, but as the detective arrived, one of the officers came over to her. He didn't know sign language, so the pair of them wrote down their conversation on her detective's notepad. Yes, she carries a notepad, some stereotypes are true. The officer has a hunch, and a good one. The burglar broke into the house knowing full well the homeowner was watching him, a highly risky thing to do. But what was most peculiar was the list of items that the burglar had been trying to steal. The officer shows her the list, and her jaw drops. G-Shock watch, food processor, Nike Air Jordans, R.L. Stein books, a Tamagotchi. 
An officer across the room remarks that these are all really high demand items at the moment. His own wife and kids have been pleading for some of these for weeks. The crime scene photographer agrees. It all gets written on the notepad so that the detective can follow the conversation. What was this man's employment status? She asks. Unemployed. She looks around the room. There's not much in the way of furniture here. Just a couch pointing at a big TV. The detective drives home right away, to the surprise of her boyfriend. He gets up from the couch and comes to see her right away. He's dressed much better, a white shirt on. He's tidied the house. The TV is off. He goes to start apologizing as soon as she walks in, but she brushes it aside, signing urgently to him. I need you to tell me everything about what you've been watching on TV. Confused, he runs through his list of regular shows that he's been watching. Buffy, Quantum Leap, The Fresh Prince, Friends, of course. She shushes him. What about commercials? All the things you've bought recently, talk to me about those commercials. He looks stumped. They're just normal TV commercials, nothing special or exciting. They're all different, different actors, messages, companies. It clicks in the detective's head. That's it. What about the voiceover? I don't know, it's a man, I think. Yeah, it might be the same man. You know what, I think it is. It's the same voice each time. And he only does those commercials? Her boyfriend thinks hard for a second. He nods. It takes a long time for the police to mobilize, as usual. The detective takes her findings to the commissioner at her first opportunity, but he looks pretty nonplussed. This spate of burglaries and muggings, all because of some persuasive voiceover actor, really? Everyone wants a Tamagotchi. Everyone wants a pair of Jordans. These are just passing fads. That's all there is to it. So, she does it herself. The detective visits all of the advertising agencies that ran the local versions of the commercials she has listed and finds the details for the voice actor on her third try. He's in the same state, but another city. But by the time she gets an afternoon to drive out and pay him a visit, it's too late. The apartment she visits is empty. After banging on the door for several minutes, a neighbor sticks their head out of a window and yells something at her. The detective can't understand, however, so the woman comes downstairs and writes a grumpy note. He's dead, yacht accident or something. Only she can't spell yacht properly. The detective pushes open her apartment door dejectedly. All that effort, all that chasing for nothing. It wasn't so much about trying to solve the burglaries. Those were just things being taken. It was about understanding what had happened to the love of her life, her kind, caring boyfriend, the man who'd brought her so much joy, who had always been so considerate and gentle with her, suddenly going on a spending spree and almost bankrupting her. It just hurt too much. And now, coming back to her apartment and having to face up to that tense relationship just felt... Arms wrap around her and hold her tight. Her boyfriend's hand brushes the back of her hair, and the smell of his cologne fills her nose. After a moment, her arms wrap around him. After another moment, they both start to cry together. He leads her into the kitchen, where he's cooked her favorite chili again, only without the smoky smell. She looks around the kitchen. The food processor is gone. He pulls away from her and explains that everything is gone. All of his bad purchases he'd made have been returned. He hands her the cash for them in full. He still wants those items. He wants them more than anything else, he explains. But more than any of those things, he wants her. The TV is gone too. So as they sit down that evening together, they just enjoy doing nothing together for a bit, catching each other's eyes over dinner and smiling uncontrollably before getting out a sheet of paper and writing another job application. There's something about this application, the detective thinks. This one could just be the one. Ask anyone about the 90s, and they'll have more fads to tell you about than historical events. Furbies, Beanie Babies, Gel Pens, Napster, the list goes on. But for residents in a certain part of the USA, some of these trends seem to touch more obsessive. And that is all down to the actions, or rather, the voice of one man. SCP-661, the world's best salesman. We didn't get to meet SCP-661 today, so allow me to introduce him to you. The salesman is a middle-aged Caucasian male. He is somewhat overweight, but with no major health issues aside from what is typical for someone of his age and size. If you were to have a conversation with SCP-661, and I advise you not to, you would find him rude, abrasive, and tiresome. He has a short temper and makes regular demands. You would quickly find that he is very much used to having his own way, and for good reason. For you see, this salesman is persuasive. Very persuasive. Foundation testing has found that this SCP is capable of extreme manipulation, verbally persuading you to want what he tells you to want, virtually instantaneously. It sounds dramatic in those words, but the effect 
is far more subtle than you may realize, which is the reason why he was able to operate for a while before being discovered by the Foundation. Test subjects report the effects of his persuasion as feeling like a continuous, low-level compulsion, a desire bubbling away underneath the surface until they encounter an opportunity to act on it. At this point, it becomes an all-consuming obsession, not satiated until you have fulfilled the urge. The effect is strongest with physical objects, which is likely why this salesman enjoyed so much success providing voiceovers for local marketing campaigns. Any product that he was selling would fly off the shelves anywhere where the commercial featuring his voice were aired. Perhaps those crazes in the 90s weren't so innocent after all. Testing on the salesman has proved enlightening. D-Class personnel were ordered to physically assault him, but he was able to stop the attack almost immediately by simply explaining to them that they didn't want to hurt him. However, test subjects who were threatened with execution if they stopped attacking him were able to continue to beat the salesman up for several minutes before the researchers decided he'd had enough. Though notably, they made it abundantly clear the entire way through the assault that they didn't really want to hurt him. SCP-661 naturally poses some level of threat to the general public, as his abilities could easily be used for far more nefarious purposes than selling a few more troll dolls, and so guards have permission to terminate him in the event of his escape. That seems unlikely. SCP-661 is held in a standard holding cell measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Any researchers interacting with him must wear noise-canceling ear protection at all times, unless they are deemed to be totally deaf by SCP medical staff. Incidentally, it was the work of the detective you heard about today that drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-661. Unaffected by his commercial work, she was in the perfect position to connect the dots and uncover his existence. With operatives through law enforcement, the Foundation was quick to catch on to her theory and apprehend him before word traveled too far. That yacht accident story was enough to keep the public from ever discovering his existence. That said, you should still be careful out there. Who knows if another instance of this SCP exists somewhere? Have you ever seen a commercial too tempting to ignore? Watch the YouTube ad that you decided not to skip? No? Me neither. But still, be careful. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, he's scared of it. But the creature doesn't move. And neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that, that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes. He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick, but then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing, and no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it, but he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. 
It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees. Just like before, the sounds of the city melt away, the only sound coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner, and nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno! Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as the Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed, because if you see 015-IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow, needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear and it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015-IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. 
Dia 212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the boogeyman is also quite intelligent, as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Elardi was making good progress with the creature, and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015-IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young, and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. 
Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with the telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange, too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch, and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches, and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged, claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school, when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now, he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big, ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. 
That's good, thinks the derelict. It'll give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin, but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much, carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. 
When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2 but will not stop it entirely. In stage 2, beginning 1 to 2 weeks after stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning 1 to 2 days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into Stage 6. Little information about Stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at Stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm. 
perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. I hope you enjoyed this anomaly, which was recommended by Dr. Bob Squad researcher Lawman23. A young researcher is thrown against the wall so hard that his spine breaks. A man turned into a scarecrow. A woman unmoored from gravity. A man losing a vital component of his brain. All these poisoned prizes can be yours if you have your hands on a certain special object. The thief is confused, to say the least, at the sight before him. It isn't exactly what he has been expecting to find on his travel to the Forgotten Cave. The strange object is displayed on an altar, with a beam emanating from somewhere above, shining a bright column of moonlight onto it. This must be the treasure that he was sent here for. But what was this strange treasure? He's still aching all over from his long journey, many days and nights spent crossing the desert just to reach his destination. All around the cavern are precious stones and gold coins, jewelry and riches beyond the thief's wildest dreams, and it's all his for the taking. Just as long as he fulfills his promise to the strange, decrepit old man he met at the entrance of the cave. The thief steps closer to the altar and examines the object the old man told him to recover. Upon hearing the word, lamp, the thief had been picturing an ornate oil jug with a handle and spout, not this thing. The thief had never seen an object quite like it. It's a tall, thin neck that winds upwards from a flat, circular base. The top looks like the hem of a dress, but far smaller and made from green glass. It's a lamp, all right, but not as this thief would know it. He lifts it up to get a closer look and notices something, an empty space beneath the stained glass lampshade. It looks like there's a part missing. Nearby, he comes across another curiosity, a rounded, almost perfect sphere of glass with an elongated protrusion terminating in a metal connector. It seems like it would be the perfect fit for the vacant port on the lamp. So, figuring out how to affix the two, the thief attaches the light bulb to the lamp. To his surprise, the bulb begins to glow a light blue. Cautiously, he places it back down and backs away, uncertain about what is about to happen next. A sudden plume of blue smoke erupts from the lamp, and the thief ducks for cover, thinking the object has exploded. But there's no loud sound, no flames, and this prompts him to peek out from his hiding place to see a mysterious figure emerging from the cloud. It looks to be an older man, hovering above the ground, not legs, but a tail of the same smoke as the rest of his body. Now the thief recognizes what's going on. He's grown up with stories of creatures almost exactly like this one, and it fills him with a rush of excitement. It's a genie. He can remember as clear as day tales about genies. They are mystical wish-givers, imprisoned within lamps and then bound to the person who discovers them. Once it emerges from its slumber, a genie will then offer whoever freed it three wishes. Hey, you there! You gonna hide all night? Come on, kid, let's get this over with. What'll it be? The genie asks rather brashly. The thief approaches the smoky, translucent figure and immediately knows exactly what to do. He's already thought of exactly what to ask for the wish that can free him from his life of stealing and poverty. Genie, I wish for you to make me rich, he says. As soon as he's finished his sentence, the genie vanishes, leaving the thief confused. Surely he still had another two wishes. He's startled as the light bulb he had affixed to the lamp suddenly explodes, for real this time, with a spark and a shower of small glass shards. 
before the thief can so much as call for the genie to return and demand that it explain itself, he feels a sickly churning in his stomach. Something is very, very wrong. After a few short moments of violent and painful sickness, the thief lays dead on the floor of the cavern. If one from a more advanced period of history were to examine him, they'd find the thief's body exposed to an extremely large overdose of vitamin C, enough to kill him. The genie had made him rich. It just goes to show the old warning to be careful what you wish for is always applicable, especially when you find yourself making a wish from SCP-4035. Although it might look like an unassuming table lamb from the outside, within it stored an ancient entity who also happens to be wildly unpredictable and a bit of a jerk, to be completely honest. Anyone examining SCP-4035 will notice the first odd thing about it fairly quickly. The lamp itself is rather unremarkable, composed of a simple iron base with a conical lampshade above. Its patterned stained glass sports a number of shades of green, and overall, it looks like the type of lamp you might find at a grandparent's house, or a distant elderly relative who always tells you just how much you've grown when you visit every five to ten years, and whose home decor hasn't changed since the mid-1970s. But the first of SCP-4035's many strange properties is that it doesn't actually seem to work. Closer inspection of the lamp itself will reveal that it doesn't actually have any electrical components whatsoever. There's no wiring running through it, no cable leading to a plug that can be affixed to a wall socket, no switch, nothing. Except for a standard light bulb socket. So naturally, anyone coming across this seemingly useless table lamp will feel compelled to find a light bulb and see if the thing actually works. That's when things get even stranger. Light bulbs placed into SCP-4035 will indeed illuminate, despite the lack of electricity powering the lamp. There won't appear to be anything unusual about its functionality at first, other than the bulbs inserted into SCP-4035 will produce a blue-tinted light. But surely that's just because of its ornate stained glass lampshade, right? Wrong. Shortly after placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, that's when he emerges. Who is he? Well, the Foundation knows him as SCP-4035-1, but for the sake of brevity, let's just call him the Genie. Emerging from the lamp will be an entity that seems to be gaseous in its composition, lacking a tangible, physical form, and instead appearing to be incorporeal, almost like a ghost, or a man made of vapors. This being has been described as having the characteristics of a middle-aged, balding man, looking to be somewhere between his 40s and 50s. Whenever he appears, the genie always looks the same, always sporting a patchy brown suit coat. Beneath, however, he has no visible legs, and in their place is a cloud of blue gas that emanates from the lower body of SCP-4035-1. As soon as SCP-4035-1 appears, he will strike up a conversation with whoever placed a light bulb in the lamp that contains him. Now, you might be forgiven for, perhaps, predicting how the next interaction typically plays out. After all, you've seen Aladdin. A genie appears and offers to grant the person who discovered its lamp three wishes. However, the person making the wishes has to be very careful with how they word their requests to the magical entity. One wrong word, and they might find themselves suffering some unforeseen consequences. Or perhaps it unfolds like other myths and fables involving genies. The wishes are granted, but they come at a terrible, maybe even fatal, price. Well, you'd be almost right to expect something like that from this genie. But let's just say that SCP-4035-1 doesn't exactly enjoy doing things by the book. The genie introduces itself, usually under some randomly selected false name. Some favorites of his during past encounters have included Bobby, Spiff, Danny Fry, and Josefi Krakowski. Now you can see why just calling him the genie is a lot simpler. Anyway, after he manifests, SCP-4035-1 won't offer three wishes, but instead offers to sell a product to whoever placed a light bulb in SCP-4035. Attempts to ask the genie to elaborate on the product being offered are usually met with an evasive response and little detail being revealed. Once the person or subject talking to SCP-4035-1 responds, the genie then, in effect, grants their wish. They can just be trying to converse with the entity, but it will regard even a completely unrelated verbal response as an answer. The subjects typically receive a biological modification or other anomalous ability that directly relates to what they said to the genie. And we do mean 
directly. Once again, you might be forgiven for expecting that being granted supernatural powers by a magical genie would be a fun experience. After all, who doesn't want anomalous abilities? But be warned, the abilities SCP-4035-1 hands out usually fit the description of lackluster and disappointing. Why? Well, because typically, the anomalous modifications the genie makes are highly detrimental to the subject in question. You see, SCP-4035-1 has a habit of taking things extremely literally, almost to a pedantic extent, intentionally misinterpreting and leaving any who accidentally make a wish with it harmful changes to their minds and bodies. And like most genies from mythology, this one doesn't undo the wishes that it grants. After bestowing someone with abilities that usually leave them in agony or distress, the genie disappears back into SCP-4035, causing the light bulb inside to violently explode. Should someone attempt to replace it and get the genie to reverse whatever horrific change it has made, its voice will emanate from the lamp and yell, Sorry kid, no refunds. But how bad could these abilities possibly be? Well, to find out the answer, you only have to take a look at a select few of the numerous tests the SCP Foundation has done involving SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock, at one point in time, is assigned to be the head researcher in charge of conducting experiments on SCP-4035. The approach he takes is sending members of disposable D-Class personnel to interact with the lamp and genie, then record the results. The first test unfolds as follows. The subject, a D-Class with the designation number D-4088, is sent into the containment chamber that houses SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock instructs him to place a light bulb in the socket and request telepathic abilities from SCP-4035-1. However, as the genie emerges, its sudden presence startles the D-Class, and he makes an expletive exclamation that we won't repeat. It was words to the effect of, what the heck is this? As a result, the genie grants D-4088 an ability that relates to the sentence he said, and to call it particularly unpleasant might be something of an understatement. You see, because of a certain word the D-Class had used, the genie gives him the ability to identify the chemical composition of what we'll refer to as waste. The fact that he can even identify what kind of creature said waste comes from does little to make D-4088 happy with his newfound power. Dr. Bannock is forced to refine his experimentation strategy following this bungled first attempt. In the lead-up to the second test, he informs the next D-Class candidate of what exactly they will be facing when they enter the chamber, so as not to be caught by surprise at the sight of the genie. As a result, the second D-Class subject repeats the process of activating SCP-4035 and calmly repeats the request for telepathic abilities that he's been told to ask for. I'd like to be able to read minds. Unfortunately, his wording means things haven't exactly gone according to plan. Testing with this subject reveals he hasn't developed any telepathic abilities. Disappointed, Dr. Bannock has the subject released back into Foundation incarceration alongside his fellow D-Class prisoners. However, several weeks pass, and it soon becomes apparent what ability this inmate has been granted. He encounters another D-Class, one of many pulled from maximum security prisons around the globe, this particular inmate has a tattoo on his forehead of a few words in Chinese. However, to the former test subject, these phrases appear to have been translated to English and read, Cuban butter mustache. When he reveals the mistake made by his fellow inmate's tattoo artist, the subject is attacked and beaten up. He had, however, gained the ability to read minds. He can understand any form of writing on the forehead of a living being. A little time passes, and Dr. Bannock finds himself still struggling to get SCP-4035-1 to bestow any worthwhile abilities to test subjects. The genie just seems to take everything far too literally, interpreting every wish with no regard for normal speech and colloquialisms, even disregarding the safety of the person making the wish. Dr. Bannock conducts yet another test, sending a member of D-Class to speak with the genie and telling him to wish for muscle regeneration. The D-Class places the request with SCP-4035-1 seemingly without issue. However, then comes the next part, testing whether this new anomalous ability actually works the way Dr. Bannock intends. The subject of this latest experiment is intentionally injured. As this happens, his body appears to rapidly change. His muscular system swells up and multiplies, increasing from its original size. A successful test, right? 
Well, it would be if the rapid muscle regeneration actually stopped. Before long, the D-Class test subject's muscle tissue is almost 250% bigger than its original size, making it much bigger than the rest of his body too. The subject is clearly highly distressed, although fortunately, this doesn't continue for long. Unfortunately, that's because his body can't function normally with this new rapid change, and as a result, the D-Class subject's vital signs stop after three short seconds. Getting more and more frustrated with the disastrous outcomes, Dr. Bannock makes the decision to simplify the requests made to the genie. Surely it can't misinterpret one word, can it? The next test that Bannock conducts sees yet another unwitting member of D-Class, D-1899, entering the containment chamber and placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, just like her predecessors have done. She follows her instructions, and as the genie appears, she asks for one thing. Flight. A short while later, the genie once again vanishes and leaves D-1899 with her wish. She has instantly become unaffected by the Earth's gravitational pull like normal. Within seconds, she is floating above the ground, as if experiencing the zero gravity of traveling in outer space. That certainly sounds idyllic, doesn't it? After all, who doesn't wish they could fly? To be granted the unique opportunity to view the majesty of the world from high above. Just one problem, though. Getting back down. D-1899 quickly realizes, as does an agitated Dr. Bannock, that she isn't in control of her newfound flying abilities. She can't alter her direction or return back down to ground level at will. She's stuck, floating in the air, only able to affect her trajectory by propelling herself off of solid structures. The results of SCP-4035 tests continue to be somewhat undesirable to say the least. An interaction with the genie that begins with the phrase, uh, hey man, causes the D-Class who spoke to be suddenly replaced with a crude scarecrow. When another subject makes a wish for a new life, they die almost instantly. Only four moments later, one of the Foundation's researchers to suddenly give birth to a baby with identical genetic makeup to the now deceased D-Class. Another test sees a member of D-Class personnel enter the containment chamber with the instruction to wish for whatever they can think of. Put on the spot, they're unsure what to request when the genie appears, and instead, they only offer up the response, I don't know. Moments later, this subject falls into a catatonic state and eventually passes away. An autopsy of the subject's body reveals that their hippocampus has been removed. Thanks to the genie, they literally didn't know anything. Further testing with SCP-4035 is later carried out, however, it should be noted that the next instance of a recorded experiment with the genie isn't one that was authorized by the SCP Foundation. Rather, hearing that there was a genie being tested, junior researcher Jacobson decides to try and make his ultimate wish come true. He's never been all that lucky in love, and it's left the young Foundation researcher with a little insecurity. Nothing that a visit to SCP-4035-1 can't fix, surely. Despite not being authorized to use SCP-4035, junior researcher Jacobson approaches the lamp within its containment chamber. He then repeats the process to make SCP-4035-1 appear, and then requests that the genie grant his wish. Make me more attractive? In an ideal world, this scenario wraps up with junior researcher Jacobson becoming more handsome by conventional standards, perhaps even improving his sense of insecurity as a result. But by now, you can probably guess, that isn't what happens at all. Instead, being as literal as ever, the genie grants the young researcher's wish and makes him more attractive. Seconds later, as soon as the genie has demanifested, Jacobson is suddenly flung across the containment chamber and smacked sharply against the solid wall. The sheer force of the impact gives the junior researcher a severe spinal fracture. Of course, this catches the attention of Foundation security, who bring junior researcher Jacobson to the on-site medical center. There, he is given a full analysis, and this reveals the extent of just how attractive the genie has made him. Junior researcher Jacobson's epidermis, his outer layer of skin, has been given properties similar to that of a high-powered magnet. He has been magnetically attracted to the metallic walls of the containment chamber, resulting in a spinal injury that would claim his life only two hours later. The extensive testing with SCP-4035 is still ongoing, and as a result, the Foundation sees it fit to keep a large supply of light bulbs near the lamp's containment chamber. Dr. Bannock's research seems to indicate that while a person is in close proximity with SCP-4035, they are more likely to suffer a sudden and inexplicable speech problem. 
For example, the most common of these are parapraxis, commonly known as a Freudian slip, or ankyloglossia, which is a condition wherein the skin joining a person's tongue to the bottom of their mouth is shorter than usual. And this affects normal tongue movement, sometimes being called a tongue tie. Being closer to SCP-4035-1 increases the chances of suffering some form of unintended speech mistake by 68% when talking to the genie. To cut a long story short, the genie doesn't just intentionally and obtusely interpret everything literally, but also directly affects how clear a person will be while making their wish. As for exactly where SCP-4035 comes from, there's little information available. Some theories suggest it might well be an actual mythological genie who is just tired of spending so many centuries in the business of granting wishes for mortals. After all, imagine you get trapped in a desk lamp for all eternity and have to magically fulfill the requests of anyone that comes across you. Living through that for so long is liable to make a genie bitter and petty. Then again, perhaps the genie isn't even really a genuine genie. It doesn't inhabit an oil lamp but instead a broken table lamp and instead of granting wishes in the way they're intended, it misinterprets and takes things too literally, leaving the poor fools who thought they'd be blessed with supernatural powers to deal with the consequences. But perhaps that's the point. If nothing else, the genie residing in SCP-4035 serves as a reminder of that important lesson, to be careful what you wish for. In any case, if we were going looking for a genie, we'd take the friendly Robin Williams type over this pedantic jerk any day. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost in fact that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait, 
The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait, he has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop but it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this plan, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now. But why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. 
he knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired, 
Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattest were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. 
The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2611, Large and in Charge.